argue actually get inflation under control, especially if uh, a lot of the supply side issues are um, beyond central banks and policy control. The only thing you can do is damp demand to try to bring the economy back into equilibrium. I would not be quick to judge that we are out of the woods when it comes to inflation. The Fed has somewhat abandoned the specific 2% range target. Some of the leading indicators are indicating right now we're probably in a slow patch. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keene. Thank you for being with us on radio and television. It is six days. Next Thursday, the mid-bay, the mid-mark, I should say, of 2022. And Lisa, there is only one word out there, recession. Recession, as we look at a correction and a bear market in stocks, we do see a rally continuing today. And perhaps yep. this will be the first week in four uh, that we actually get gains. But the nature of gains highlights the conservative nature of of investors with people hiding out in some of the safer stocks. Well, hiding out in uh, yield uh, it was well. Price up, yield down. We've seen under 3% in the two-year yield, 3.01%. Lisa, what have you seen away from full faith and credit? How does investment grade react to recession? Well, it depends how deep the recession is. And this has basically been the theme of the week, the theme of the year. How yeah. deep is the contours of this recession? And if that's the case, have we already priced in a shallow one? Do you get income from some of these higher rated assets like investment grade credit? That said, you continue to see outflows that we have not seen in history from bond funds. Equity funds are starting to follow. There is a feeling that we have further gloom to go if we do get uh, some sort of recession, which many people think is likely. In the mid-year, I I guess, and all that can be said here is we're going to readjust over the weekend and really think about the path forward. Kaylee, what is the thing you see? Or Kaylee lines in for John Farrow uh, today. Kaylee, what is the item you see into your weekend reading? Well, I'll be looking at 10 a.m. Eastern time for that University of Michigan consumer sentiment data, not just around sentiment, which right. we know already is at a record low, but those inflation expectations, because Chairman Powell told us himself, Tom, he's keeping a very, very close eye on those expectations. Bigger than claims, maybe even bigger than the retail sales. Let's dive into that right now. Kaylee, when we look out five years and then look out another five years, the basic idea, and you mentioned this yesterday, the good John authors questioning, are we unanchored? Well, and that is something that Bill Ackman of Pershing Square raised in a series of tweets uh, overnight, saying that this bond market, as we've seen two-year yields coming in instead of going uh, mm -hmm. up further, is misreading the Federal Reserve, that basically it's a communication problem on the part of Jerome Powell when pretty much every other Fed official across the board is moving towards 75 in July trying to forecast this, that this bond market is asleep and the Fed is going to continue out hawking itself until the bond market it wakes is. up she's because ultimately Lisa, inflation expectations it. are becoming entrenched well, in this economy. I mean, that's She's a problem. It. Okay, folks, the Friday tape is a snooze fest, according to K-Lines. <laughs> so let me give you oh, the snooze fest. Tom. Let me give you the snooze fest data check, and maybe Lisa will save us uh, in the brief. Maybe there's an auction today or something like that. Green Dream on the big. screen, as Lisa <laughs> mentions, futures up 33, Dow futures up 240. The VIX is a story for me from 32 through 30, down to 28.68. I got to mention BitDog, because crypto is here, 20,700. Bitcoin's had a quiet week which is maybe uh, good and good for it. Oil, Brent crude, 111. Dollar gives way a little bit fractionally, particularly against the larger pairs. Yen from a 136 down to 135.01. Euro, 105.51 as well. And on yield, I'm sorry, I go to the two-year yield, 3.02%. 10-year yield, 3.09%. Lisa, save us with a brief. <laughs> well, I just want to say it is a boring tape, and that is news in and of itself. We yes, have gotten yes, so yes. much volatility, and suddenly... We get calm. We get stasis. We get a sense, perhaps Bill Ackman is right, perhaps the bond market is wrong, but the bond market is consistently saying that the Fed will not have to move as quickly because we are already seeing a deterioration in both financial conditions as well as the economy. We get a latest read on that from 10 a.m. Uh, with the University of Michigan Sentiment Survey for the days of June 9th through June 20th. We're expecting it to fall to another lowest level going back more than a decade. As Kaylee pointed out, a lot of us are going to be looking at the expectations 
expectations that consumers have for inflation over the next five to ten years. Perhaps Bill Ackman is concerned about inflation expectations becoming unmoored, but the pessimism that businesses and consumers alike are feeling are putting a natural damper already. And you're seeing that in retail sales that are coming in, and you're seeing that as people start to restrain some of their spending. At 4 p.m., we get uh, the International uh, Monetary Fund's Kristalina Georgieva speaking on the U.S. economic outlook, <laughs> expected to probably downgrade some of the expectations after speaking first with Jerome Powell and Janet Yellen. How does she dovetail a U.S. economic outlook with the rest of the world that, frankly, is in much worse shape by all accounts? How does she talk about yeah. the potential systemic risks emerging from that? And this weekend, G7 government leaders gather in Germany from Sunday onward for a three-day summit ahead of uh, the annual NATO summit in Madrid on Tuesday. How much do they could talk about inflation? What can they do, Tom, when so many of these issues are yeah. specific, idiosyncratic uh, problems, whether it has to do with supply chain disruptions well, from China to the war uh, that Russia is waging and in Ukraine? folks, this is a really important thing, and we're not really going to cover it today because the news flow is so extraordinary. But there's this idiosyncratic item, Lisa. There's another idiosyncratic item, whether it's El Salvador in crypto, it's the Philippine election, and it's Thai bot giving way and on and on. It's sort of like idi idiosyncratic June, isn't it? <laughs> idiosyncratic pockets yeah. of distress as people cope with prices that they have not seen <clears throat> in terms of how quickly they're rising. I'm going to make a banner for this, folks. You're not going to see it on radio right now. Pre-pandemic inflation expectations, 2.9%. Volcker inflation expectations, February of 1980, 9.7%. Eric Friedman has lived this. He's chief investment officer at U.S. Bank Asset Management Group. Eric, how do you defend ownership of equities from people who say, look, we've been through high inflation before. We'll get through high inflation again. I think, Tom, you have to really frame the, the part of the equity market that's, that's going to add value in this environment. And basically, really long duration equities, so think speculative tech, those with earnings hopes versus actual earnings delivery, that stuff we think will remain for sale. So we do think that, that cash flow and owning cash flowing equities still makes sense. But again, I think the idea that, that this is a, hey, you have to own the whole equity tape is, is, a, is just not where we are right now. So inflation expectations, and I think that Lisa had a great tweet earlier in the week. I mean, when you see uh, the two-year move in 50 basis point clips, that tells us the market is not fully digesting what the Fed is about to say. And we are more on the bearish side. We think the Fed will be more restrictive than markets currently expect. Eric, I love how you put it, that you're still donning bear costumes until the Fed uh, flinches. What do you think the market is currently underestimating with the Fed? How far they will be able to go or just the resolve to pull a Volcker to take a more aggressive stance? Yeah, we're normally glass half full. Uh, you know, we, we like the risk premium trade, Lisa. But in this environment, we just think what's what's different with respect to the Fed's intention really boils down to liquidity. And we're entering a fairly illiquid, just seasonal uh, part of the, of the counter, if you will. And if you add on top of that, the risk that M2, I think a date that, that probably isn't being talked about enough is uh, June 28th, which is when the Fed will release this next M2 uh, a data source. And, and so bottom line is this, we think that as you have tightening monetary policy, which we think <clears throat> Uh, perhaps uh, Chair Powell has been more of the, the good uncle, if you will, talking down or at least uh, maybe soothing a bit of expectations. But we do think that if you add on top of the risk that M2 uh, contracts and the Fed gets more aggressive, we think that that's a, that's a recipe for just tighter financial conditions than markets expect. So we do think the Fed has a mandate that is going to be challenged by oil prices. We also think that shelter costs remain a, a lagging indicator. In other words, there will be a lag effect in inflation that really boils down to higher shelter costs, which we think is going to push the Fed to be more aggressive than the market currently thinks. Well, and we heard from the chairman on Capitol Hill yesterday saying that their resolve is unconditional in fighting inflation, which raises the question of if the Fed even is going to flinch, if it's not a question of until the Fed flinches. Given everything you just said, is this market appropriately pricing the risk out there, or do you think we have further to fall? We think we have further to fall, Kaylee. I mean, it's a little bit like, you know, your, your University of Virginia basketball team. Every once in a yeah, while, they, they may, you know, they, they may show some uh, some flashes of a of a high potent offense. But, you know, it is a it is a formidable uh, defensive team. And we think that this is an environment 
where having that that more defensive cash flowing nature makes sense for for investors. And really, it's, it boils down to this. We talked last time we were on about the nature of two repricing. This repricing one being a reassessment in the bond market of the Fed's expectations. We still think that first repricing, meaning it yields up prices down, will continue on the front of the curve. The second part of the repricing boils down to later this year, and we think there's some vulnerability to S&P earnings. We do think that in nominal terms, S&P earnings have been pretty sticky. But we do think that the risk of demand destruction, that second repricing, right. is going up. So that's why we think there's probably a little more downside. Again, quarter end, a lot of noise yeah. in the next couple of weeks. But again, we think the bias is going to be throughout the, the balance of the summer, uh, lower prices across yeah. risk assets. God, I wait for Virginia Colgate in basketball. That will be something. Eric Friedman <laughs> thing. I don't think there's anybody over six feet on Colgate basketball. We'll have to check that <laughs> out statistically. Eric Friedman, thank you so much from Colgate at University and, of course, with U.S. Bank. Um, as well, I have no idea what he's talking about with, with – um, University of Virginia. You know, in Kayla, University of Virginia hockey is just extraordinary. I mean, do they even have an ice rink in, in Charlottesville? They used to. I think it got torn down or converted into restaurants. They're, or they're converted into a Denny's. Why did, I, <laughs> why did I know this as well? The news flow is extraordinary. Open question, Lisa, of the blur of news today. What has your attention? I mean, it's definitely the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment uh, <clears throat> Survey. Yeah. And in that, how much does some of the gloomy rhetoric kind of be a self-fulfilling prophecy? It's <clears throat> all going to be about feelings today and how we affect them, Tom. I'm going to go away uh, from economics, finance, and investment. I, I'm, I'm going to go to, these, at least as you mentioned, all these idiosyncratic moments, starting at the beginning of the week with Tunisia essentially shut down. There's a lot of different international relations stories to watch and think about into the weekend, including the president's trip to Riyadh coming up here yeah. in uh, July. Uh, we'll have much more talk on that from Washington here. And of course, the historic judicial decisions from Washington uh, and legislative decisions as well. On the equity markets at 7 a.m., Amy Wu Silverman. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. It's being called the biggest breakthrough in U.S. gun safety in three decades. The Senate voted 65 to 33 to approve bipartisan legislation that will improve background checks, secure schools and give states money to fight gun violence. The House is also expected to pass the measure. The Senate passed the bill hours after the Supreme Court issued a landmark ruling that could mean more guns on the streets of big cities. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell calls his commitment to curbing inflation unconditional. Powell wrapped up two days of testimony on Capitol Hill by warning that the Fed is very far from its inflation target. Meanwhile, Fed Governor Michelle Bowman told bankers in Massachusetts she supports raising interest rates by 75 basis points again next month. And in the UK, Prime Minister Boris Johnson has suffered a major election upset. His Conservative Party lost a key parliament seat in southwest England. It's the first time that the constituency, Tiverton and Honiton, has not voted Conservative since it was formed 25 years ago. The Liberal Democrats won the seat. It is an unprecedented move for China in dealing with Hong Kong. Bloomberg has learned that Beijing has asked foreign business chambers in the city how to revive its reeling economy. The chambers are said to have responded with one overriding message, end Hong Kong's COVID quarantines immediately. Hackers have stolen $100 million in an attack on a cryptocurrency bridge, an app that lets people swap coins between blockchains. Harmony says it's working with national authorities and forensic specialists to identify the hackers and retrieve the money. Crypto bridges are seen as being particularly vulnerable to hacks. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. This June, in honor of Pride Month and Juneteenth, Bloomberg brings you a special equality series every Thursday in June at 1 p.m. Eastern. Bloomberg Equality, celebrating inclusion this Pride Month and all year long. I am fully convinced that Ukraine is European nation because they prove 
every day by fighting uh, against uh, the aggressor that they defend European values, they defend democratic values. And so they are fighting not only for their freedom, they are fighting for our freedom. The economist from Lithuania, Mr. Noseta, he is the president of Lithuania in conversation yesterday with our Maria Tadeo. We will look at the domestic gun issues of America in our next hour with Emily Wilkins with us now in Washington as well. But we go internationally here with Ms. Tadeo in Brussels. And uh, Maria, I can only say yesterday that was a conversation of the moment before we get to the zeitgeist into the weekend in Brussels. What I find so important is this word blockade. Putin says there is a blockade on his isolated Kaliningrad. Is there? Well, if you ask the Russians, they say that's the way it's heading. If you ask the Lithuanians, and remember, these are trains across through the country, they say there isn't. But the technicalities around it, uh, Tom, are so important because Russia could technically use that to say this is belligerent behavior. It is an <coughs> act of war and potentially target the Baltics. What changes here, and this is so important, again, when you look at the map, is that this is a NATO country, and this is coming right before a NATO meeting next week in which, of course, the Eastern European countries will all ask the president of the United States, but also Germany, that they want more men, more weapons fully stationed on the eastern flank. Maria, in the meantime, we heard some strong words out of Germany yesterday, including even if we don't feel it uh, yet, we are in a gas crisis. And then German officials coming out and saying uh, that there could be a Lehman moment in Russia's uh, curtailing of gas supplies to European nations. How is that being received? Well, Lisa, I have to say, I've never heard that kind of language from a German official. We all know what Lehman Brothers means. We all know what that triggered. And to use that uh, type of language to talk about the energy crisis potentially facing uh, the European Union really does show you the severity behind the scenes of the scenario the Europeans are facing potentially. There are real concerns today that Russia could at one point unilaterally cut the flows. The Europeans are essentially racing against the clock to get the storage ready by November. If not, they're essentially in the hands of Vladimir Putin. Now, behind the scenes, there are some concerns that that kind of language could really create a sense of panic, that that could feed onto consumers. That is the last thing the Europeans want, panic. But it does catch up to the reality on the ground. The Europeans have essentially, to be very clear, three months to fill up the storage. Otherwise, you get to winter, the most vulnerable time of the year for Europe, and you're in the hands of Vladimir Putin. There's no other way to put it. Yeah, of course, energy, an even bigger problem for Europe than the U.S., although that's something that's dogged the Biden administration, Emily. And frankly, President Biden is not in great domestic political standing at the moment. As he heads to the G7 this weekend, can you characterize the power he brings to this meeting versus the meeting of 2021? I mean, it's certainly not as much power as he had previously. He's gone from having really high approval ratings to ratings that have now, in some polls, slipped under 40 percent. He is facing an election this November that is likely to see Republicans uh, take the U.S. House, potentially the U.S. Senate, and that's going to really limit Biden's ability to get things done. Story on the terminal this morning talking about some of the private concerns that German officials have, saying that the U.S. has been such a leader in really keeping the EU and its allies together and putting pressure on Moscow and worrying that the U.S.'s role is going to be compromised if they have divided government starting next year. So it's definitely a difficult position for Biden to be in. He's not coming with the same power that he did in this last time. And there are lots of questions about what the administration is going to look like moving forward. And Maria, what are you hearing from your European sources about this, about how they view the U.S.'s ability to act as a leader here? Look, I think I would actually tone it down a big time from the international perspective. Of course, every country has national politics, and everyone here can see the polling for the president of the United States. They can see the approval rating. But the reality is that when you look at the weapons, the United States has been an incredible supplier uh, for Ukraine, much more than some of the European <laughs> countries. When you look at the money that this country is essentially paying now into Ukraine, it's huge for the Europeans. This is still an administration that they can count on. And also, to be fair, this is
is not a problem that the United States has created for Europe. This is an issue in the making now for 10 years for the European Union, depending so much on Russia. And now, of course, the penny drops. This is not a problem the Americans have created mm -hmm. for Europe. This is entirely self-made. Marie Chideo, thank you so much in Brussels. And, of course, Emily Wilkins in Washington. And in our next hour, for our international audience, we will address the two issues of gun legislation and judicial activity uh, in Washington that we've seen in the last 24 uh, hours. Lisa, to get back to what we do with Futures Up 31, to me, the heart of the economic analysis this weekend is which matters. Headline inflation, let's call it 8 percent, or core inflation, 6 percent in maybe declining well, you know, honestly, we've heard from the Fed chair Maybe. himself uh, that they're looking at both because headline inflation is what allows people to have higher longer term inflation expectations. I'm trying to wrap my head around what the two year yield is looking at, what bond buyers are looking at in terms of headline or core inflation, because either way, they're seeing well, it come down in a way that it's not in actuality. At least that's the implication by how low some of these yields have gone over the past yeah. couple of trading sessions. Let's turn to the esteemed 21st century philosopher. Kaylee Lines. Dr. Lines, <laughs> can you explain why stocks go up if there's such recession worries? Well, the thesis being, and it's always hard to assign actual you know, narrative around the market action. But for so long, we have seen yields moving higher, putting pressure on the real giants within the equity market, which is the large cap tech stocks, which traditionally, even those multiples have come down some, they're still richly valued. And those high multiple stocks have been pressured by higher yields. As you see yeah. yields coming <clears throat> in, that helps. And also, if we're talking recession, some of those cyclical value trades that have done so well this year aren't going to hold up as well in a slower growth environment. And does that mean you actually pivot back to the growth stocks, which can and, carry and, the market higher? And Lisa, that goes to what Eric Friedman said there about margin pressure. I mean, everybody's got an angle on this, but uh, Mr. Friedman of U.S. Bank makes real clear he sees a second tranche of margin, margin challenges. All I can say is you've got Meta or Facebook down 53% year to date. You look at a potential little bounce, and so this is not exactly in. a rally, right? How much is being priced in? Where is it being yeah. priced in? And what's being purchased? Because it's not a wholesale mm -hmm. risk on full-throated, yes, let's go kind of rally right. that we're seeing. It is a rotation, a tepid rotation into yes. healthcare <laughs> stocks and certain tech stocks. I mean, this is very nuanced as people try to pick up uh, as something right. that can productive in a downturn. Let, let's talk about the real yield. I think this is important, folks. Well, my entourage showed up late this morning. They're all out partying last night. <laughs> and I got a 10-year real yield, Lisa, 0.57%. Uh, That's a lower real yield but over the week. This goes to the whole feeling that the Fed's not going to be as aggressive. They're not going to tighten monetary conditions. And I'll just tell you, their balance sheet hasn't come down pretty much at all. So whatever quantitative tightening, yeah, Lisa, I think probably should be. That's not why I asked Lisa. Quantitative uh, tell spaces. me I'm not doing the real yield this afternoon for Pharaoh. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, you, know you know, I think the entourage is coming in. John Farrell, rumored time. to be back next week. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Surveillance, good morning, everyone. John Farrell off this week, a well-deserved week off. I think he went to Staten Island. He said he was going uh, south. Kaylee Lines in for John Farrell, Lisa Bramwitz, and uh, Tom King getting ready for mid-year. Getting ready to move on. We need to do a data check quickly. I'm going to make it real quick. Equities up, up 30. Uh, the Nasdaq 100, let me get the percent point on there because that's the way Mr. Farrell would do it. Yeah, up nine percent. tenths of a percent. The VIX 28.64. Good morning, John. Dow futures up 207 points. We'll leave it at that with yields churning here this morning. As Lisa mentioned, a nudgy tape uh, to say uh, the least. Let's get right to it, and we're going to dive in a little early here on banks. And, yes, it's after the stress test, which I guess we're sort of unstressful. And I want to give you a national indicator. We talk about milk. We talk about live cattle. We've got the other prices, Lisa and I whining about it 24-7. Here's what matters. In Southwest Harbor, Maine, there is Beals, which everyone goes to that's ever been north of Portland. Their 90th anniversary, Beals Lobster Pier, and I'm sorry, Gerard Cassidy of RBC Capital Markets, leading citizen of Maine. A lobster roll at Beals is $41.99. Tell me, first of all, about what that does to tourism in Maine. Well, Tom, those are expensive prices. And for all the lobster lovers out there, that's a steep price to pay for a lobster roll. But believe it or not, the early signs from the state of Maine, the Department of Transportation, we're on a level to break the records for tourism this year. So 
The prices are not keeping people away. And after, Other than eating two or three lobster rolls, maybe you only can eat one. Yeah, I'll cut it back to two. That'll work out. Uh, yeah, thank you. $80 for, to get through uh, lunch. Okay, let us talk about the stress test. Came out glorified. The bank's minting money, but they deal with that inflation like Beale's Lobster House. How do the banks deal with inflation and cutting costs with cash flow up to their eyeballs? Tom, it's a really good question because what's very interesting now with the banks is that with these rising interest rates and their asset-sensitive balance sheets, you're seeing the margins widen out quite dramatically. And in fact, if the Fed raises rates again in July, as they're expected to by another 75 basis points, you're likely to see net interest revenue growth this year for many of our largest mm -hmm. banks between 15 and 20 percent. We haven't seen that kind of growth, Tom, in decades. So how they're going to combat the higher inflation is they are getting higher revenue growth through spreads. And you might remember when the margin expands, there's no incremental cost. You're not going out hiring loan officers or opening branches. This goes right to the bottom line. So that's how they're going to combat inflation, as well as keeping a tight rein on expenses as we get into the second half of this year. So, Gerard, a lot more interest income, potentially a big buffer against losses that we just heard from the Federal Reserve, and the ability to buy back billions of dollars of their shares, as they'll probably announce over the next couple of weeks. Why is the KBW index down 23% year-to-date, and why do so many people still see this area as a potential for losses? Now, you, you put your thumb right on it, and the challenge that investors are having today is, is the tug of war between the better revenue growth, as I just mentioned, from net interest revenue, but offset or partially offset by the rise in cost of credit. And as we remember, following the 2020 pandemic, the banks built up their reserves for massive credit losses that never materialized. And so the bank's balance sheets today are incredibly clean. They're de-risked but investors remember 2008 and nine, and unfortunately they think that's what could happen in the next recession, which we don't believe at all. We're thinking it's more like 2001 than 2008. Interesting. The reason that you mentioned on the downside for banks this year is the fear that the credit will really deteriorate and offset those benefits from higher rates. Gerard, a lot of this is fear, as you're saying. It might not be reflected the fundamentals that you're looking at. When do investors start to look for banks to take on more risk? And I don't mean with respect to lending to consumers who are heading into a downturn, but with acquisitions, with using some of the cash that they're using to buy back shares to actually invest in technology that they say is the future. No, it's interesting because on the M&A front, you are seeing some smaller deals. J.P. Morgan Chase is the biggest of the banks that are doing these fintech deals, very small deals relative to the size of their balance sheet and capital. But in terms of big bank M&A, that's on the back burner right now because of the changes in, in the uh, heads of all the regulatory agencies in Washington, new changes coming maybe in rules on M&A. So it's really damped it down. So what they're doing, though, is they're spending on technology and the banks are, many of the banks are cutting edge on technology like a J.P. Morgan or Bank America. If we could talk about loan growth for a second, because that has been very hard for banks to get back in the post-pandemic area because there was so much fiscal stimulus that people didn't really need to take out loans. Now that borrowing costs are going higher, I'm wondering what your view is on what loan growth is going to look like from here, considering earlier this week, Bloomberg had a scoop that J.P. Morgan is laying off hundreds of people in its home lending business because of higher rates. You're right. The, the residential mortgage business is very cyclical, just like the investment banking business. And, and because of the rise in rates, many uh, homeowners are not refinancing. And that's really cut into the origination volumes on residential mortgage. However, what we are seeing now is as we move further away from the pandemic, and many Americans have less savings now because they've used their stimulus, credit card receivables finally are now back at 2019 levels. Commercial lending is growing in high single digits. So we are seeing loan growth. Loan growth is tied to nominal GDP growth. And with nominal GDP growth probably coming in this year in the mid to high single digits because of inflation, you're likely to see the banks grow their loan portfolios in the mid to high single digits. Mm -hmm. And again, it's being led by commercial and consumer. 
Well, and as we're beating the drum toward the University of Michigan sentiment numbers later on this morning, Gerard, through your lens of banking analysis, how do you view the health of the American consumer right now? According to the numbers that we see, and even as evidenced by Bank America with their chairman and CEO, Brian Moynihan, pointing this out last week in Boston, you're seeing the consumer in very good shape. According to the Bank of Boston, I'm sorry, the Bank of America numbers, what you're seeing is that in the uh, consumers that had about $1,500 in deposits prior to the pandemic, that, that Bank of America customer today, the typical customer, has something close to the $5,000. So the consumer, based upon their debt to income, is, is in good shape. And we anticipate as long as employment stays relatively strong, right. um, the consumer is in good shape. Gerard, in the pandemic and in the digital lift that we all had, digital speeding up, going faster and faster, mm -hmm. how threatened, given the pressures the banks face, is the branch system? Tom, it's, it's really interesting because when you and I obviously had our first real jobs, we got a real paper check. You had to deposit. So the branch was extremely important to mm -hmm. capture those deposits. That no longer happens, as we all know. So the branch system today is less important than it was 30 years ago. And as, as you see in the numbers, we're down probably 20% from peak branches back in 2008 yeah. when the introduction of the iPhone came on. So I think, Tom, what you're going to see, branches will always be here, but there will be far fewer yeah. of them in the next 20 years. Fascinating. Al from New Jersey just emailing in saying, tell Cassidy, Keen hasn't had a real job in 20 years. Gerard Cassidy, <laughs> thank you so much with RBC Capital Management, who actually remembers back when I had uh, a real job as well. Lisa, we got to talk about this boom economy Cassidy just itemized up in Maine. A Beals Lobster Southwest, Lisa, this weekend. The Abramowitz household can have the six-pack pre-cooked lobsters in from Southwest Harbor for $550, $92 per lobster. I'm sorry, Lisa, that's a boom economy under any description. Except that the Bramo clan cannot have a $550 <laughs> six-pack of lobster rolls, as much as that does sound delicious. And the distinction between Maine lobster rolls okay. that are cold and Connecticut ones that are warmed, and we could have that debate. This goes to the heart of this question that we have so far companies have been able to pass along the costs people are still buying those exactly. lobster rolls and, and they have powell, been able to jack them up i don't mean to interrupt but powell said that in his lead sentence this week he said it's a strong economy and yet the recession word dominates this week's discussion. And how much is this a self-fulfilling prophecy? How much are people saying this is what the Fed has to eventually cause in order to bring prices down? And how much is the narrative running ahead of reality? And that's what we're seeing when we look at yields that are coming in, bond prices up, as people expect that perhaps we're already there. We're already in a recession despite the strike. I mean, it's mind spinning, Tom. It's hard to put this together, especially at a time when you've got companies and the individual analysts saying everything's still really good. We you don't know what you're talking about. You know, email comes in, Kaylee, Margie, Margie and Ray's in Virginia Beach, Virginia, saying, would you lose the lobster chat and give us some a Virginia crab chat? I mean, mm. from everything you see, Kaylee, it's a boom. I, for our international audience, we need to say this. It's a crazy boom economy. Well, that's the thing about it, Tom. And as we talk about UMish sentiment figures coming later this morning, sentiment has been sour for some time, and yet it only is starting to reflect at the margin on well, activity data. Yes, yeah. you had retail sales disappointing, but it's not like things are turning dramatically as sentiment has. I guess the question now is now that all those savings accounts are drawn down, now that people well, are turning to leverage once Lisa, again in please. order to keep spending, at what point do things turn in a more sharp fashion. Well, before we all get too happy, I mean, not that I want people to be unhappy, there but let's go. reflect the reality of this going on. If you look at real wages, they're as negative yeah. as they've ever been. People's salaries are not keeping pace. They are buying less with the money that they're earning, even as they get raises. So a boom economy, and Tom, this goes directly to a point you've been harping on, which is a boom economy in nominal terms only not necessarily in inflation adjusted terms. This is a mm. new boom economy that is a masked, really tepid economy in terms of growth, and, and that's what sentiment is reflecting. I would partition folks across deciles, and this is gonna be very yes. important, maybe elucidated in the Michigan numbers, where the people up with Gerard Cassidy at Beale's uh, Lobster Shack in yeah. Southwest Harbor, it is the upper, upper deciles uh, to be 
Uh, sure. A really interesting conversation. Of course, on banking, we'll have that with J.P. Morgan earnings. I'm guessing third week of July. Futures up 30. Nasdaq up 1% right now. The VIX 28.69 dollar. A fractionally weakness. Stay with us after our lobster break. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Actions by the U.S. Senate and the Supreme Court have underscored the deep divisions over gun policy. The Senate voted 65 to 33 to approve gun safety legislation. It calls for improving background checks, securing schools and giving states money to combat gun violence. The House is also expected to approve the measure. Senate passage came hours after the Supreme Court issued a landmark ruling that would mean more guns on the streets of big cities. Five Republican members of Congress are said to have contacted the White House after the 2020 election, seeking pardons from President Trump. That's according to video testimony played by the committee investigating the January 6th insurrection. The congressmen included Matt Gates, Scott Perry, Andy Biggs, Louis Gohmert and Mo Brooks. Bloomberg's learned that the U.S. is set to escalate a claim that Mexico violated a free trade agreement. The dispute has to do with Mexican policies that favor state-run energy companies. A dragged-out conflict could lead to the U.S. imposing tariffs on Mexican imports and could increase tensions between the two countries. Wall Street's biggest banks are now set to return tens of billions of dollars to investors. They all passed the Federal Reserve's annual tests of their ability to withstand market turmoil. The stress tests showed that banks such as JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs could handle a severe recession. And in the UK, consumer confidence dropped to a record low lot this month. Rising prices, a squeeze on incomes and disruptions from strikes took a toll on the national mood. The market research firm GFK says its measure of sentiment fell one point to minus 41 in June. That is the lowest reading in the 48 years of the survey. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. It's unconditional, our commitment is, and the reason is that um, uh, we need to, in a particular situation, we have a, a, a labor market that's sort of unsustainably hot, and we have, we're very far from our inflation target. We really need to restore price stability, get inflation back down to 2%, because without that, we're not going to be able to have a sustained period of maximum employment. Jerome Powell, on his unconditional focus at 10 a.m. this morning, the University of Michigan, five and 10 year forward inflation expectations, 3.3%. Lisa, it's not a boring Friday. That's a key statistic for the week, for the month, for Chairman Powell to get him to July 27th. When do people start talking about things getting unmoored, like Bill Ackman was Unanchored, saying? Yeah. Uh, at what point do we get to an entrenchment <clears throat> in inflation expectations that the Fed has to fight aggressively regardless of how weak the economic data is? Tina Fordham with us. The future's up 30 right now. Founder and Gio Political strategist Fordham Global uh, 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 Foresight joins us uh, right now. We're thrilled to have her on this morning. Tina, I want to digress to the British elections and the uproar of Mr. Dowden, the conservative Tory party leader, resigning at 5.30 in the morning uh, London time. And I want to go out far west of London on the way out to Cornwall. And this is not the time of poll dark. This is the time of now. And north of Exeter, Tiverton and lovely Devon. I hope I'm pronouncing everything correctly. And Boris Johnson was absolutely crushed. What is the symbolism that he was crushed in friendly Devon going back to 1935? Well, it's it's another blow to to this prime minister who, nevertheless, as you will have seen, Tom has vowed to to carry on um, exactly as he has been. Um, we've had scandal after scandal. The, the chairman of the Conservative Party, as you've said, uh, resigned this morning in a, a you know, sternly worded letter. Uh, and yet Boris Johnson doesn't seem to have plans to go anywhere. And that tells you a lot about the times that we're living in. Um, there, there certainly is no, uh, no shame in politics, no, no sense of accountability. And as long as the labor leader, Keir Starmer, um, is not, you know, a, a serious challenge. 
Johnson will probably stay where he is. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, defying the laws of political gravity. By-elections in the UK uh, aren't typically, you know, very, very much participated in. Pollsters will tell you that they're of minor importance. But again, in the face of, of so many crises that this government is facing, um, how many times can Boris Johnson get on a plane and go see his friend uh, Zelensky in, in Kiev when things are looking tough at home? Tina, you point to this political gravity or lack thereof uh, that Boris Johnson has and other leaders may have as well as we face a lot of individuals who want to be heard about the pain that they are feeling in the face of inflation. And that brings us to some of the strikes and some of the protests that we're seeing erupt throughout Europe, throughout the world. What is the hot spot that you're watching and what is the consequence both politically and economically uh, that will result? Well, strikes and inflation go hand in hand and uh, coming out of, a, of the pandemic and probably heading into a recession. And with those uh, workers who are on kind of fixed contracts, not having seen a, a pay rise for a very long time, you know, the old summer of discontent term is being banded about a lot. Um, you guys were talking about uh, the price of, of lobster rolls. Um, you know, similarly, I can say that British Airways is threatening, I think, meaningfully here in the UK to start striking as soon as school vacations begin. Um, that's going to be very unpopular, but the question is whether it's going to, to actually force a compromise in advance. Um, in the UK, this is very acute. Uh, France also is, is known to, to have strikes and that will recur. And, and I guess what I feel is there's a sense of, of, of helplessness about this. For, for so many public sector and other workers, wages have been stagnant through the pandemic and, you know, it's just taking inflation to focus minds. Tina, we talked about lobster rolls tongue in cheek because this is the least of our concerns. It's basic staples, it's wheat, it's basic meat, Thank it's all of these That's other uh, basic uh, groceries and gas prices that are impeding, as Tom said, the lower deciles. How do we look at possible, possible fiscal spending to offset some of the pressures that are very real, very tangible, and a big threat, particularly to the lower income individuals around the world, in Europe in particular? Well, of course, the people most acutely affected are, are the very poorest in EMEA and those who depend on, on grain supplies that are being blockaded by Russia out of the Black Sea ports. Um, and so that's happening in the Middle East, where there are many concerns, which I've addressed elsewhere, about kind of Arab Spring 2.0 and that sort of thing. In developed countries, uh, we don't get riots or civil unrest in the same kind of way. We get more organized expressions of popular discontent. Um, and that means strikes, of course, uh, and protests. Governments, having responded with so much fiscal largesse during yeah. the pandemic, are really going to be expected to step up. And what I think we're already seeing is fuel prices and subsidies for fuel prices are going to come first. Food is a bit more difficult in, in developed countries, right. but um, winter heating, winter fuel allowances and those kinds of subsidies um, in the UK and Europe, I, I think, are uh, just a question of, of when and not if. Tina, we only have about a minute left, but as we talk about the economic pain so many countries are feeling, are we going to start seeing a, a dissolution of the resolve of the allies to continue to support Ukraine, inflict economic pain on Russia, when it's inflicting so much economic pain on their own domestic populations in return? Are we reaching that breaking point? We're not there yet, but at the G7 meetings, um, the measures that are being contemplated, uh, gas rationing in Germany, for example, um, the question of whether Russia just flat out, you know, cuts gas supplies to Europe as punishment in what um, a tactic called coercive diplomacy, uh, it's very real. It'll be winter before we see push come to shove on this, but that's why getting the gas storage facilities in Europe filled uh, is crucial. They have to fight this. They can't give in to Russia. I think leaders understand this. Can they communicate to, to citizens the need to make sacrifices is a bigger question because politicians don't like to, to take, they like to give. Tina Fordham, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it. With Fordham Global Foresight here on an eclectic set of issues, including stunning election results uh, in Britain, truly stunning. The historical reach of that back to pre-World War II is really uh, remarkable. Lisa, I've got to touch on this because I mentioned Tunisia 
I don't know, five days ago, six days ago, and I got some emails and love notes saying, why are you mentioning Tunisia? No one cares. Let's remember the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring is happening in Ecuador in the last 24 hours. And Lisa, I'm sorry, it is an end of June where food dynamics, I'll say, and food angst for the poor really click in. And keto, and, and really, really challenging there. The suit, the suit. Let's show that right now. If we could on radio, we're showing the protests uh, in Ecuador. This is a fixed exchange rate, so we can't use currency, Lisa, as a litmus paper for social struggle. Yeah, uh, but it can be used in other places as well. Bill, Bill Dudley pointing to the, the international concerns as yeah. one of the financial stressors that we should look at in addition to the social ones. We look forward into July and maybe a July and August of food challenges. I uh, look at corn, a bushel of corn. Corn stable through the week in America. Futures up 29. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. How do you actually get inflation under control, especially if uh, a lot of the supply side issues are um, beyond central banks and policy control? The only thing you can do is damp demand to try to bring the economy back into equilibrium. I would not be quick to judge that we are out of the woods when it comes to inflation. The Fed has somewhat abandoned the specific 2% range target. Some of the leading indicators are indicating right now we're probably in a slow patch. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keene, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramo. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramwitz, and Tom Keen on a Friday, an important Friday, eventful six days from that mid-year point. Kaylee lines in for John Farrow, well-deserved sabbatical for Farrow. I'm unsure. Is he back Monday, Lisa? It's like 50-50, right? Well, you know, based on where he <laughs> is know, vacationing. Probably his team will say, well, he's on a runway and wherever he is, and he can't get home because of British Airways or, you know, whatever. And well, We can look forward to uh, his return. There is an issue of what happened this week because this was actually a fascinating week and my biggest question tom is is the bond market rally that we have seen this way a good thing or a bad yeah. thing for risk assets what does it mean <clears throat> well it means to me the 210 spread is the vanilla spread has really not moved all that much so maybe it's a churn we'll look at equities with amy with silverman here but i'm going to go to the little tea leaves that are out there javier blas with his leadership on hydrocarbons nails it on european coal Javier just noting 424 per ton. That's the way they spell it. They're T O N N E. I don't. I don't get that. Really? Ton. <laughs> really? Is this going to okay. be throughout the morning? It's that uh, it, kind it's, of day. It, huh? it, it's, it, it's a little over a hundred dollars per ton from where it was during the invasion. This is a serious statistic. It's a serious statistic because of the plan that Germany has in place that if they pass a certain threshold in terms of depletion of their hordes of natural mm. gas, yeah. they're going to turn to coal. This is a nation that's been trying to make its energy clean. Cleaner. And then once it gets past those reserves and they continue to go down, then they start with gas rationing. This, to me, is a political hot yeah. potato that's going to have to be discussed well, in many okay. places if we deal with the same kind of tight supplies. Le, pa Le, Le Potage showed, whether it's in France or not, Kaylee, I'm sorry, I can link together Javier Blas and coal in Germany or the Netherlands, wherever that statistic's from, with the riots we just saw, the protests we saw, rather, in Ecuador. I mean, all of these tensions wrap around price change. Yeah, it's the rising cost of living, Tom, and it's creating quite drastic political unrest in some countries, and it's just reflective <clears throat> in the results of elections in others, like in the UK, with uh, those by-election results we saw this morning, yeah. where the Conservative Party is taking the heat for the rising cost of living in the UK at the same time that sentiment hit the lowest level on record due to higher prices and the fear of an economic slowdown. Yeah, Francine in London emails in and says, Tom, lose the French, you can't speak it. Thank you, Francine. It's good to know that. Did you get that, Kaylee Le Potage show? Mm, like hot perfect pronunciation. Let's, yeah, <laughs> very good. Let's do a day ton. Let's do a data check here. Oui, and oui. we want to quote in tons. Uh, 29 up, 29 on futures. Dow futures up 2418. VIX nicely in on the week. This is an important item of good feeling in equities. 28.70 uh, in the equity, uh, in the VIX space, I should say. Uh, dollar churning here, but resilient 104, 238. Euro 105, 37. Some of the EM currencies still give way like Tybot. Lisa, a brief. Well, the stasis in this week's market is fascinating to me. And, and I'm not just saying that because there's nothing going on and I need to find something fascinating. It's because we're getting more and more concern being spoken about by Fed Chair Jay Powell, by a growing number of economists 
and yet nothing. If anything, there's a rally in bonds and there's a rally in stocks. 10 a.m., do we continue to get that rally with the University of Michigan sentiment survey coming out for June uh, 9th through the 20th, considering the fact that it's expected to fall to a new post-2011, 2010 low? How much are we also looking at inflation expectations over the next five to 10 years climbing? What happens if we see those climb even further and then bond yields continue to go down? What does that mean in terms of Fed credibility, in terms of what their path is to come, and whether the market is underestimating how aggressive they're going to be? At 4 p.m., we hear from IMF's Kristalina Georgieva speaking on the U.S. economic outlook after she previously spoke uh, with Jerome Powell and Janet Yellen. How much does she signal a weakening in the U.S. outlook based on their previous forecasts and how that dovetails into, Tom, what you're talking about, the international stress, the international strife stemming yeah. from higher prices and a weaker economic backdrop. I'm so glad you did this with the managing director of the IMF, Lisa. I thought about this last night over a beverage of my choice. Can you imagine the halls of the IMF in Washington right now with Tunisia, Ecuador, EM currencies giving way? I mean, which meeting does she go to next? And what is her policy recommendation at a time when inflation is at the forefront, yet a stronger dollar yeah. only pressures these nations further? And this weekend, we have G7 government leaders gathering in Germany from Sunday uh, through for a three-day uh, summit ahead of the annual NATO summit in Madrid. How much do they talk about inflation? And again, Tom, what can they do about it other than just simply offset it with fiscal spending and having some sort of supplementary income, as a lot of people think is likely, it's certainly in Europe? We'll have to see. You know, I, I, I'm sorry. We're just going to have to see how it, it folds out. And our international team, of course, will uh, uh, give some good perspective on that. I know that Emery Horton and Maria today are really focused on G7 uh, meetings and the trips of President Biden coming up. Right now, I demanded that we speak with Amy Wu Silverman, writing brilliant notes for RBC Capital Markets and a hugely controversial note right now uh, uh, on this summer. Amy, you say this summer is different for volatility. Discuss. Oh, well, look, good morning, guys. I think that normally, you know, you look to history the last 30 years, Tom, and Seasonally, this is supposed to be a low time for VIX. This is supposed to be, you know, when people's minds wander to vacations and volumes go lower and, you know, realize volatility comes crashing in. I don't think that's going to be the case, frankly. And I think that you're already starting to see that dichotomy play out in single stocks. So, you know, an ongoing theme in derivatives markets has been why hasn't volatility been higher? Why has SKU not picked up? But you are seeing that in the single names. And I think as earnings swing this time around, we will see an overall level even higher than we do from the levels that are already high right now. Amy, weigh in on the conundrum in markets right now. Are people underpricing the margin compression that we're going to see in this earnings season or has it already been baked in? Yeah, look, it's a tough question. I will tell you that on, on the broader ETF level, that complacency is there and has been there for a while. But what, what interests me is that, Lisa, on the single stock side, you're seeing that pick up in demand for downside protection, which tells me idiosyncratically that it is not baked in uh, on many stocks. And this isn't, you know, kind of unique to one sector. It's not just energy or, you know, long duration tech. This is kind of across the board. So it's almost as if people are are quickly monetizing those hedges on the index side, obviously, as you know, overall markets go down. But they're still seeing that worry come in on single names. And I think as earnings starts to come into play kind of mid-July, uh, that will become a key theme again. And we will see that is not quite baked in yet. Amy, this nuance adds to my confusion about the complacency in markets this week. And I keep going back to the question, is the bond market rally that we've seen this week, the retracement, some of the gains that we saw in two-year yields, a good thing or a bad thing for stocks? Yeah, it, it, here's what I'll say. When we look to the options market, there are a lot of bond proxies uh, that you can use to play. So like a TLT, an LQD, HYG, BKLN. I will tell you, Lisa, that there's still a lot of massive hedging going on, especially in BKLN and HYG. So, you know, the way I would think about it is the derivatives market is certainly not saying that everything is 
you know, warm and rosy. And you're starting to see that tick up, not in S&P and IWM, but in these bond proxy ETFs. And that has been the case uh, kind of consistently through the year, even as people quickly monetize. So I think, again, you know, as we get into the summer and you, I think you're in this kind of like dead zone right now, but as you start to get more information coming in, as we get earnings, as we get through to more CPI numbers, that will start to trickle in again, especially on those bond proxy ETFs. Amy, really since the start of the pandemic and the boom of, of meme stock trading, I've been talking to you about retail activity because we know for a very long time they were all in on call options. They always bought the dip. And I noticed some research out of J.P. Morgan yesterday talking about how that is changing. And actually last week among retail investors, their data showing they reached the heaviest selling since September of 2020. What are you seeing around retail activity? Yeah, so... Look, there's a nuance I want to make here because I think when people speak about retail, there's two kinds of retail, right? There's there's the people who are YOLOing GameStop call options and, and trading on their Robinhood account. And then there's retail in the PWM sense. So, you know, Tom's uh, Tom's portfolio, for instance, what he's doing in his portfolio. You mean triple leverage and one, all cash? <laughs> so a conversation <laughs> I've been having with Laura Palacina is... I think that retail, the retail who played the GameStop and the AMC, you know, and maybe crypto has capitulated and you do see that playing yeah. in the derivatives market, but that is not true necessarily of kind of the PWM retail crowd. So, you know, you know, ask yourselves, are you sitting through this market or are you capitulating? Right. And one thing Lori says that I think is interesting is <clears throat> we may not see that because they are trained to ride through these markets. And so you may not right. actually get a capitulation from that cohort. Amy, you mentioned 40 on VIX is being the new 30. Are you just essentially predicting we'll, we, will, we will enjoy a catharsis to 40 on VIX? I think it's possible. You know, I, I always like to break it down back to how you feel about that on a daily basis, Tom. So, you know, mm. a 40 VIX is a plus or minus 2.5% right. move per day compared to 1.89% on a 30 VIX. Do, do I think we'll get that on earnings? Yeah. Very possibly. You know, I, I do think VIX is underperformed yeah. right now. Amy, do something constructive over the weekend. I want you to check the kurtosis of my triple leveraged all cash fund. I think, you know, there's some cross moments there in triple leveraged all cash that are really uh, painful. Amy uh, Wu Silverman, they're brilliant as always with RBC <laughs> Capital Markets. Cash is something worth talking about, Lisa. Seriously, I, one of the most interesting things we saw, heard this week, Federated Hermes talking about two times cash moving from 3% out to a 6% long only buy side holding. That's a big deal. Yeah, your strategy is finally working. My favorite part of the morning is always when guests humor you and you ask them for things and they kind of nod politely and sit there wondering, when do I get to, when do I get to, to leave here? Uh, but this has been an asset class and we do see flows into cash uh, for the first time in, a, in really in mass. Mm. Yeah, we will have to see. Let me do a data check here. Up 28 on SPX, Dow up 199. The VIX is impressive in uh, in a point three eight points twenty eight point six seven. Brent crude one eleven fifty one. Please stay with us on radio and television. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word. I'm Rishika Gupta. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell calls his commitment to curbing inflation unconditional. Powell wrapped up two days of testimony on Capitol Hill by warning that the Fed is very far from its inflation target. Meanwhile, Fed Governor Michelle Bowman told bankers in Massachusetts she supports raising interest rates by 75 basis points again next month. It's being called the biggest breakthrough in U.S. gun safety in three decades. The Senate voted 65 to 33 to approve bipartisan legislation that will improve background checks, secure schools and give states money to fight gun violence. The House is also expected to pass the measure. The Senate passed the bill hours after the Supreme Court issued a landmark ruling that could mean more guns on the streets of big cities. In the UK, Prime Minister Boris Johnson has suffered a major election upset. His Conservative Party lost a key parliament seat in southwest England. It's the first time that the constituency, Tiverton and Honiton, is not voted Conservative since it was formed 25 years ago. The Liberal Democrats won the seat. Shares of Twitter are higher in pre-market trade. According to the business site Insider, Twitter sent 
further user data this week to Elon Musk, who wants to buy the company. The latest data includes real-time information, which allows the Musk team to determine how many users are actually bots. Last week, Musk's lawyers sent Twitter a letter complaining that the data they were being supplied wasn't enough. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. This June, in honor of Pride Month and Juneteenth, Bloomberg brings you a special equality series every Thursday in June at 1 p.m. Eastern. Bloomberg Equality, celebrating inclusion this Pride Month and all year long. I was just talking to the governor of New York about this. I am disappointed in the Supreme Court gun decision. The gun laws in 40 of these states are still in place based on the decision. Not good enough, but it's, uh, I think it's a bad decision. I think it's, I think it's not reasoned accurately, but I'm disappointed. The President of the United States on an eventful day for America with not one but two, a legislative and a judicial decision on guns. For those of you in New York, it's simple. Read the crime blotter of the New York Post and you'll get a flavor for what we're living in. Of course, so many of you across the country asked Mr. Griffin a citadel of the path from Chicago to Miami. What we have done at Bloomberg, and this is not just Bloomberg surveillance, but across all of Bloomberg, is get legal authorities that can assist us here on thinking through these very contentious issues. One of those is Noah Feldman, of Harvard University. He is a scholar writing of the middle 20th century Supreme Court of James Madison. Feldman scathing on Justice Thomas yesterday. There's no other way to put it. This means concealed carry is now basically an automatic right. This is to wear the weapon out in public. Increasingly, this court appears to be the Thomas Court with the most conservative justice convincing the other conservatives to follow his lifelong practice of ignoring precedent and rejecting the idea that the real-world consequences of judicial decisions should matter to the courts. Emily Wilkins translates in Washington this morning. Emily, let me stay on this judicial decision, as I know Lisa wants to go on other paths. What happens next for concealed carry in America? So you noted Justice Thomas's opinion on the decision. I would also say that it's important to note what Justice Kavanaugh and Chief Justice John Roberts wrote in on their opinions because their language was a little bit softer. They said that, you know what, these laws in New York that say you can only have if this permit, if you've got the certain job or a certain other thing, that's no good. But right. they can have restrictions on concealed <clears throat> carry. It just needs to be the same restrictions across the board. It'll be very interesting to see how New York... Uh, Mayor Eric Adams, as well as other mayors of cities where uh, these laws are currently implemented, right. are going to find ways to cut into that restriction, figure out exactly what cities can or cannot do. It's not Bloomberg's idea here, Emily, to get into the political ballet, but what does this 6-3 this, this, this decision signal of the pending cases coming up? I mean, I think that all of Washington is very aware that we have a much more conservative court. And I think Washington, I mean, the, the big case that's coming up is Roe versus Wade. We could see something on that as soon as today. Remember, the court oh, really? actually added today as a decision day. It wasn't initially. It's now been added. Now, it might not come today. It might come next week. Uh, but we've heard reports of uh, police officers in D.C. kind of getting ready for potential protests and fallout from that decision today. So we could potentially see it. Obviously. Obviously, it's being expected that this is going to really cut into Roe v. Wade, that could potentially bring things back to the states. We right. ask lawmakers, how do you respond to this? What is going to be uh, the next step that Congress can potentially take? The one thing you've heard from them right now is that it really depends on exactly what the ruling says. But let's face it. I mean, Congress has struggled to get through gun legislation. Even the bill that we're seeing today is pretty narrow. The idea that they'd be able to do something more on abortion uh, or even gun legislation, it, it would be very difficult 
difficult to do given the current level of partisanship in Congress. Emily, dovetail these hot button social issues and the court's view on them into the midterm elections and this com uh, complicating debate between these social issues versus inflation. What does this do in terms of the Democrats' likely outcome from the midterms and beyond? Well, I can actually let uh, Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell answer that one for me. He told reporters yesterday that one of the reasons that he was backing this package of gun proposals was, number one, he thought it was common sense. And number two, he thought that it was important uh, for their midterms, that it's going to help suburban voters see that Republicans do care about this issue. And suburban voters are going to be key in a number of races, both in the House and in the Senate this November. And so there's definitely an election aspect to this. It will be interesting to see how much things like guns and abortion do drive out voters to the polls. Um, it's certainly midterms. A lot of the game is on turnout. Who can you actually motivate to come out and vote? Uh, but on the whole, when you talk to Americans, when you talk to pollsters, when you talk to lawmakers, really the number one issue is still inflation. It's those high prices at the gas pump, those high prices in the grocery store. I think that's why you saw Biden come out and call for that gas tax holiday. Um, I think, though, at this point, there really is not the appetite in Congress to take that up, which of course leads to the question, what are they going to do to show the American people that they are taking this issue seriously? Well, Emily, as we talk about some of these issues related to the Supreme Court, these are hot button cultural topics. I mean, Second Amendment rights, abortion rights, and we know that where the American public opinion is based on a polling data, research data, isn't necessarily aligned with decisions the court is making, or at least according to draft opinion, seems that they're ready to make. Is there any more conversation in Washington about reforms to the court. I know when the president came into office, there was a conversation about court packing. There was, and I think like so many other issues, there are simply just not the votes right now to be able to do something like that. Even for some Democrats, I mean, that would be a little bit far to try to add additional justices to the Supreme Court. Uh, there's certainly a couple bills in the works looking at the ethics of uh, judges, uh, both in the Supreme Court and across the federal system. Um, but that is sort of taken a sideline to other legislation that we're seeing go through right now. I mean, these are definitely hot button issues, but we're at the point where we just have a Congress that isn't moving forward on a number of these things because of the partisan gridlock. And even though you see these surveys that show that Americans really do support a number of these issues, that doesn't always translate into how they vote. And that's why you're seeing the Congress mm -hmm. as it currently is right now. Emily Wilkins, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it in Washington, particularly there. Uh, Noah Feldman's piece for Bloomberg Opinion as well. Uh, Lisa, to be kind, it will be a contentious summer in Washington. Yeah, especially with the court decisions that are likely to come down and going beyond people's expectations of how far the court could go. What, uh, what we just heard, though, from Emily was fascinating, that in the Republican Party, there is more willingness to go further on the legislative front to stave off some of the galvanizing effects socially for Democrats to go to the polls to basically ease some of the blow. How much does that start to get something done in some bipartisan way? I am, you know, I'm, I'm not making a formal study of this, but loosely I'm looking at elections around the world. And the, the power of the ballot box is extraordinary. Witness in England today. Lisa, the, 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 the size of this defeat of three small elections for the prime minister is just extraordinary. And will the presiding issue in the United States be inflation, right? Will it just remain that way, even yeah. with some of these social issues really percolating into the conversation well, in a massive way throughout the summer? Okay, that can be the question, and it sounds like George Bush Sr., but Kaylee Lines, I think you nailed it. It's a culture war. I mean, that's really what we're talking about. That's the place we're at in America right now, Tom. Yeah. We'll have more on this. And again, I really urge you to see the legal coverage of Bloomberg Opinion. It's truly extraordinary and informed some of the great academics of this nation on the right and on the left as well. Coming up, we're thrilled to bring you Yana Hatzius of Goldman Sachs.
Bloomberg Surveillance. Good morning, everyone. John Farrell, well-deserved week off. Kaylee lines in with Lisa Bramowitz and Tom Keen. Thrilled you're with us on radio and television. Sterling right now, 122.80 flat off of the shock of those three uh, small elections in England, all against Prime Minister Johnson's uh, future. Uh, futures in the U.S. up 32, advancing nicely. NASDAQ 100 up 1% because Dr. Hasius is with us. We'll go quickly here. Lisa, individual stocks. Yeah, I'm looking at a number of earnings that came out, in particular FedEx yesterday after the bell, that really were much better than expected. That. FedEx shares up nearly 3% ahead of the open. Tom, fascinating to see why. It's they're actually seeing some of the labor shortages ease. They're seeing profit margins come in a little bit better than expected, kind of going against the gloom narrative that we've been talking mm -hmm. about. Shopify bouncing a bit after rolling out some new features, but those shares down more than 70% so far this year. And Twitter shares getting a pop, although off earlier highs, after reporting that they are going to give uh, Elon Musk whatever he wants to see in terms of data over the weekend and Elon Musk trying to back out of the price tag that he had by asking for more. That's my interpretation because it is uh, going to be interpretation Friday. Look at the banks this morning, given the fact that they're going to be rolling out buyback plans after those stress tests. Interesting to me that Citi is not participating. How much has been already baked in? J.P. Morgan Chase up four tenths of a percent. Bank of America up also a similar amount. Tom, how much can these banks really reprise some of their value in the share? given the fact that they're down mm -hmm. more than 20 percent as a wholesale uh, so far year to date and they still have billions of dollars of expected share buybacks coming. Lisa, thank you uh, so much. From Dudley and McKelvey to the era of Hatzius, Goldman Sachs research has been about acuity. On this Friday, we're going to lose the numbers, the many numbers of Jan Hatzius's work, his team's work. But we're going to go to one number, which is your Q4 number. They've marked down GDP from a sterling 1.3% to sub 1%. That gives you some of the direction of the recession call. But at the same time, Jan Hatzius calls for a shallow recession. If we get a shallow recession, you quantify what it will mean for jobs in America. How does the magnitude of recession work into the dynamics of unemployment? Yeah, let's just uh, be clear that we don't have a recession in our baseline forecast. We do have significantly below trend growth, 0.9 percent is only half the long-term trend pace, mm -hmm. but our our best guess is that will be below trend. That rebalances the imbalance in the labor market, and that ultimately also helps bring inflation back down. That said, there's a very significant risk of recession. I think it has gone up because <clears throat> it's very difficult to reduce labor demand right. without you know the the deterioration feeding on itself and then ultimately culminating in a recession. So we're giving a one in three chance of a recession in the next 12 months, and it's close to 50-50, I think, over the next But you get 2% two of unemployment rate baked into a 2001-ish kind of recession. In 2001, it was a two percentage point increase that was the bottom end of the historical range if you look at all of the recessions mm -hmm. in post-war history. The top end of the range is five and a half percentage points. I think if we do have a recession, it's likely that it would be on the shallower end for two reasons. One, private sector balance sheets are in better shape than right. at the end of previous business cycles. And two, I think, while inflation is very high, I don't think it's as entrenched, certainly not as entrenched in expectations mm -hmm. as it was in previous high inflation episodes. 70s, mm -hmm. early 80s. Jan, we just got off a couple of weeks where people were ratcheting up their expectations for the terminal Fed funds rate to about 4% uh, as of at some point next year. And here we are looking at a huge rally in two-year yields. Can you translate the rally that we have seen through an economics lens in terms of what people are forecasting and whether it seems plausible in your mind? Well, our forecast is a terminal rate of three and a quarter to three and a half percent. We think we'll get there by the end of 2022, we don't have any additional rate hikes in, in 2023, basically because the economy is decelerating, is growing below trend, inflation is coming down. And I think at that level, the Fed would probably hold. You're right. We had priced something around 4 percent, you know, immediately after the FOMC meeting or right around the FOMC meeting. But I think people have looked at the fact that the economy actually is decelerating, and that has led to a reversal of that. And I think 
fundamentally that's appropriate. But Jan, given the fact that we are seeing a deceleration, but we're not seeing a deceleration when it comes to the inputs into inflation. We're seeing rents continue to climb at a record pace. We're continuing to see some of the disruptions to oil supplies and to food supplies that are causing some of the price increases. When do you start to talk stagflation? When do you start to talk about a Fed that is forced to act despite an unemployment rate that's rising and despite weakening economic data points? Well, I think it's a little bit more mixed if I look at the inflation indicators. No question the last CPI and the rent number there was bad. There was an increase in the long-term University of Michigan inflation expectations measure. But the supply chain measures are actually getting better. You look at the supply delivery indices and the business surveys, those are coming down. Um, the wage numbers in 2022 have been sequentially clearly slower than the second half of last year. And I think, broadly speaking, inflation expectations, look at just the break-evens in the bond market, are still very well anchored. So I think it's a, it's a more mixed picture. And in an environment where growth comes down to a below-trend pace, I just don't think that the Fed would uh, you know, keep hiking aggressively mm. when the economy is already slowing and inflation is already coming down. So, Jan, essentially what you're saying is that when Chairman Powell was speaking on Capitol Hill yesterday saying that our commitment to fighting inflation is unconditional, that there actually are conditions in which the Fed blinks. I think there are conditions where the Fed blinks, but it's partly because there is a feedback from economic activity into, into inflation. If the economy weakens and labor demand declines and maybe the unemployment rate starts edging up, then you're also just going to become less concerned about inflation. So uh, I do think the, the commitment to ultimately getting back down to 2% is unconditional, but there will be you know, factors other than the current inflation prints that will sort of drive what they do on a meeting-by-meeting on a -meeting basis. While we're talking about the specific year, words that Jerome Powell has used, I've talked earlier in the show about the tweets Bill Ackman posted overnight talking about how the Fed clearly has a credibility problem. The bond market is misreading the Federal Reserve. And what he said is ultimately that comes down to the communication of the chairman. Do you think that Powell and others on the FOMC are, are accurately communicating to this market what it is they intend to do? No, I think they are accurately uh uh, communicating, I think, in ways that 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 are clear that that they do want to get back down to two percent uh, eventually. They are tightening policy aggressively, much more aggressively than they expected to do six months ago or twelve months ago, in part because inflation turned out to be much higher. So I think at that level, it's it's all pretty clear. On the credibility problem, I would also say, you know, look at inflation break evens. I mean, the credibility from the bond market's perspective. Uh, or from the perspective of forecasters of the 2% inflation target right. still seem in, seems intact. Yeah, and I want to go to Peter Orzag of the London School of Economics in a small banking shop in New York. Peter Orzag loves the phrase glide path. And maybe that's differential equations, but let's just, it's Friday. Let's just stay with calculus. Are we completely misjudging the second and first derivative of core inflation coming in where it may come in shockingly rapidly and we underestimate that good news? I do think that core inflation is likely to come down. In fact, if you look at statistical measures of core inflation, like the trimmed mean exactly. index, like Cleveland, that Dallas, has been improving yeah. over the last few few months. It's still a little too early to tell Agreed. how much weight to Agreed. put on it. Agreed. But the, the last couple of readings have been more encouraging. And I think that does suggest that over time, core inflation is going to come down and, you know, we we're at about 4% for core PCE, core in this case defined as X food and energy by the the end of the year, and then at about 2.5% by the end of next year. So I don't think it's going to happen overnight, but I think we're headed in that direction. So when Jerome Powell says we get back to 2% inflation, that's what he's talking about. And Hatzia says Powell will get his wish in 18 months? Not quite. We're at, you know, two and a half, but uh, that's not too far away it's from 2%. Yeah, two and two and a half. It's TV. Who's counting? Especially if you look at this as a, an average inflation target. Okay, yeah. So at some point, they will, you know, whether there's a recession next year yeah. or not, you know, our be best guess is not, but there will be a recession at some point and that will bring inflation down further. I should say with great respect, I'm busting Dr. Hatzis' chops. There is a huge difference between two and two and a half percent in the inflation. 
game. Jan Hatsi assists with Goldman Sachs. Thank you so much for coming in. And quickly, with the, the headline there, at least, and no question about it, was shallow recession. This magnitude of recession until this week, Lisa, has really been underplayed amid the doom and gloom that's out there. Shallow recession. And the other interesting thing that Jan was talking about is that the Fed is not going to be as aggressive as people are currently pricing in. And that is what you're seeing reflected in the bond market today, considering that the three and a quarter percent terminal rate that he's for, uh, forecasting is well below the four percent. Well, are you saying Hansi has just moved the bond market? Andrew is that what Holland you're saying? Rice. No, I'm not saying I'm that. I'm looking but at if you four beeps up on the two year that. yield. I think Hansi has just moved the two year yield. Okay, you go you go do that. You put the narrative to that. <laughs> I'm actually looking at the uh, point of credibility also. And uh, if you look at some of those uh, futures, if you take a look at break even rates, they're close to that two percent level over the next five to ten years yeah. for the Federal Reserve. So kind of seems to support, even with a less aggressive Fed, they'll get back there. But at least, uh, Kaylee, I should say, still, Kaylee, it is about headline inflation for so much of America. Yeah. It's still a really ugly statistic. And the chairman himself spoke to that, that what Americans feel at the end of the day is yeah. the gas and the grocery bills that they are now facing. And to Lisa's point about, OK, the Fed has credibility on getting inflation down. Is it so much the confidence in their ability right. to do that or at what cost? And that's also what's reflected in the fact that yields, nominal yields, are coming lower because of concern around a recession, even if it's shallow, as Future, John Hotsius indicated. Futures up 29, uh, the Nasdaq up 9 tenths of a percent. Hotsius moves the yield market. 3.05% on the two-year yield. Please stay with us. Maybe Jan Hatzius will come back again. Do this we is call Bloomberg. The yield Good morning. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishiki Gupta. Actions by the U.S. Senate and the Supreme Court have underscored the deep divisions over gun policy. The Senate voted 65 to 33 to approve gun safety legislation. It calls for improving background checks, securing schools and giving states money to combat gun violence. The House is also expected to approve the measure. Senate passage came hours after the Supreme Court issued a landmark ruling that could mean more guns on the streets of big cities. Five Republican members of Congress are said to have contacted the White House after the 2020 election seeking pardons from President Trump. That's according to video testimony played by the committee investigating the January 6th insurrection. The congressmen included Matt Gates, Scott Perry, Andy Biggs, Louis Gohmert and Mo Brooks. Wall Street's biggest banks are now set to return tens of billions of dollars to investors. They all passed the Federal Reserve's annual test of their ability to withstand market turmoil. The stress test shows that banks such as JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs could handle a severe recession. And in the UK, consumers are starting to crumple in the face of soaring prices. The government says the volume of goods sold in stores and online fell one half of 1% in May. The big jump in food prices forced consumers to cut back on spending in supermarkets. Meanwhile, another report says consumer confidence in the UK has fallen to a record low this month. The former chief operating officer of SoftBank, Marcello Clor, has received severance and incentives worth an estimated $94 million as part of his compensation. He left SoftBank in January. He had clashed over compensation with the company's founder, Masayoshi Son. Global News 24 hours today on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Inflation is a huge challenge right now, and we know this. It's driven by two primary terrible policy approaches from Washington. We gave up our advantage in energy, and we actually took an anti-U.S. production approach. Job one, I believe, is to have a pro-all-of-the-above energy policy, which includes promoting domestic production to recapture this domestic production advantage. The governor of Virginia, Glenn Youngkin, there with David West and Balance of Power. Great to greet the governor yesterday here at our world headquarters. He's concerned about inflation in his uh, Virginia. Right now, over in Europe, there's a UBS conference in Zurich, and someone else concerned about inflation is a gentleman from St. Louis. This is James Bullard of St. Louis, and with him is Philip Lowe of Australia, the RBA who studied under Krugman at MIT, and Louis de Grindos of the ECB as well. 
well in Bullard making headlines. Lisa, help me here with the headlines from Bullard. Yeah. He is more optimistic than the average bear. Yeah, talking about how the U.S. economy has shown tremendous resilience and then pointing to household uh, balance sheets and households in general, not seeing signs of a pull pullback. Mm. Is this a good thing or a bad thing for a Fed that needs to get inflation under control at a time when people are accepting higher prices and still buying? And I'm going to say he's on the edge of Jan Hatzius here, where Hatzius and Goldman Sachs not calling for recession. I think it's is Bullard the most optimistic horse of the, around the Eccles table? I don't want to go that far. The issue is, what do they do with that? If we have a lot of momentum and yeah. strength now, how does that translate out six months from now in terms of what the Fed will have to do and where the economic indicators are pointing uh, at that time? In agreement with James Bullard to a great extent is a gentleman with Boston Advisors for years. We are thrilled to bring you right now, Michael Vogelzang. Uh, Michael Vogelzang, of, of course, has uh, done so much in economics, and we're uh, thrilled he could join us from CapTrust uh, this morning. Michael, it dovetails with your view, which is lose the gloom on a Friday, get out front by acquiring fixed income for higher price and lower yield. What fixed income do you acquire? Well, look, I think the I think the fixed income market's reasonably well balanced here. I don't I don't think, given where we are with with uh, sort of the the known impacts of inflation uh, and and the somewhat uncertain trajectory of the economy, right, whether we have a recession or not, is certainly likely to be twenty three if we do. Um, you know, I, we think we think longer term fixed income is a reasonable hedge against increased equities. That's really the dynamic here, Tom, is that we've been adding to our equity positions, given we think risks are reasonably balanced. We're down 20 plus percent, 30 percent on the average stock in the U.S. So we think actually now is a decent time to begin tiptoeing back into equity markets for long term investors. But we like to hedge that in case the economy does get really weak with longer duration assets. We've been really short all year. Now we're starting to extend. Does that so, make sense? Mike, it does make sense. And it's revenge of the 60-40 portfolio. And that's what we've seen this <laughs> week. I mean, basically people going into both. How long can that continue? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, that is the $64 question, of course. Uh, you know, I, 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 we're interested in trying to understand what risks are in the market and what aren't. Um, one of our favorite phrases at, at, at the firm at GapTrust is, the price is the only thing we know. Everything else is speculation and conjecture. And we know that prices on bonds are up from, you know, look at the two year, it's up from 20, 30 basis points at the beginning of the year up to 3%. Same thing in the equity markets, we're down substantially. Again, we feel that that gives us a pretty good insight into what risks are out there. The risks are now finally being, being recognized in the equity markets particularly. Um, and yeah, we may be early. There's another phrase I love is, you know, you probably heard this is, is Pessimists sound smart, but optimists make money. Um, we're definitely trying to be in the latter camp. Mike, how much are you looking at the consensus soft landing uh, and in the optimists making money, even if yeah. the pessimists, you know, talking yeah. about a very deep recession, sound smart? It's a really difficult decision. Um, I, I do think that in order, and it's, and it's frankly, it's out of the Fed's control. You heard Powell the last couple of times he's talked, talk about the things that he can control, right? But he can't control what happens in Russia and Ukraine. He can't control what happens to the, the long-term price of oil around the globe. This food shortage and the higher prices of food and, and some of the other metals, some of the extraction industry prices that are so expensive, he can't control those things except at the margin, right? Um, he can control housing. And that is very clearly something we're watching as, as housing goes. And we're starting to see some of, the, some of the cracks in the foundation of this incredibly hot housing market. Uh, so we think that's going to be a really good, important tell as we go forward. So, um, you know, the, the, if the Fed gets a break on oil prices, the Fed gets a break on food and some of the geopolitical stress that's out there, we think actually they can find a path to a reasonable soft landing, like Bullard, like Jan was saying. Uh, if, yeah. we, if we get a little lucky, if he doesn't, it could be more of a difficult time. OK, so given there is still a question around that, and right now you are seeing yields moving lower, you think there may be some value there. What within equities are you buying, value or growth? Or is it more well, it's interesting. than that? Yeah, it, it's, it's, you know, as we've sort of dug through the, the treatise of the, of, the, of the crash over the last three months, um, you know, it's, it's actually hard to find anything that's screaming at us. 
Um, I sent along a chart uh, that that shows the percentage of stocks in the Russell 2000, or the number of stocks in the Russell 3000, I'm sorry, the broad market, that are trading at less than 10 times earnings. And that number is over five or 515, I think, as of, as of the other day. And every time we've reached that level, and we've reached it you know, a handful of times over the last decade, what you've started to see is really good returns going forward. Um, so one year out, pretty good numbers, and two years out particularly. So we're starting to get into the territory where segments of the market are cheap. Um, and, and to me, those are things like that's housing, that's energy, that's, that's um, uh, some of the retailers. I think what that part of my portfolio looks like is, and, and what's there for is kind of a hedge against the Fed being right. That the Fed wins the game and does a soft landing and earnings don't crater, because what those stocks are estimating and, and expecting is that earnings will fall substantially. So if the Fed's right and earnings actually come through for some of these inexpensive, more cyclical companies, you're going to see some really good returns out of those. Um, I do think, by the way, it is start. It is time to begin to look at the growth side, or particularly the mega cap side of the market. Some of these names are actually inexpensive. Uh, they're on a relative basis. They're almost as inexpensive as they've been in, in five, six, seven years on a price to sales basis and so on. And I'm talking about all the big names that you all know and love. So they've had a real draw, drawdown. But yeah. um, there, there's there's no there's no clear and obvious, you know, um, what we like to call the burning building where you run in and, and you're getting paid to, to <laughs> take a big chunk of risk. There's really nothing like that. The market's reasonably well balanced. Michael, thank you so much. Michael Vogel saying with us with CapTrust here. Lisa, I'm sorry. There's been way too much optimism in the last 20 minutes. Help me out here with some Bramo gum. Bramo, <laughs> the Bramo cramp, cr the Bramo can, the lens almost broke there with Vogel saying. <laughs> no, look, he, he very well could be right, and he's really representing what's increasingly the consensus. A soft landing looks possible and actually likely as long as there is some cooperation with the international sphere. I just keep going back to what it is saying that the bond market is rallying and have stocks fully priced in the slowdown necessary to justify some of the levels that we're mm -hmm. seeing in the yield market. We'll have to see. It's an interesting hour, an interesting day in foreign exchange. We'll tease you with that in the next hour as well. Futures up 26. Dow futures up 201. Good morning to John Farrell. Maybe back on Monday. This is Bloomberg. The Fed will be able to slow demand sufficiently to bring demand down. The Fed is changing their policy narrative so quickly. The Fed is solely focused on inflation. I think the market oscillates between inflation concerns to now recession concerns. I think Powell is trying to finesse it. He can't go wobbly on the resolution to tackle inflation right now. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Looking forward to an all-important consumer sentiment reading. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television. Tom Keen, John Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. John, off today. Back next week. Kelly Lines with us, which we're very glad about. Tom, how fragile is the calm in the face of the data that we're going to get today at 10 a.m.? Well, the data at 10 a.m. is absolutely critical. So says uh, Jerome Powell, folks. This is looking out five years and then the guesstimate from five years out, another five years. And it is a question of is inflation finally anchored as it's been for decades, or is it unanchored? And that sort of squishy concept, uh, Lisa, what it means is a lot of uncertainty within the markets. We've certainly heard that this morning. Uncertainty is the word of the year, and frankly, the word of the moment, especially in light of the fact that we hear this optimism from Jim Bullard to Jan Hatzius about earnings, about consumers, about the strength of the U.S. economy, in light of a rally into bonds, Tom, that indicates perhaps slowing growth in something more recessionary. Yeah. Try putting those two ideas together. Well, the I'm to, struggling. You know, to me, Lisa, it's really important, and this is about resiliency. Jan Hasses and Goldman Sachs are looking for a tepid American economy in Q4, well under 1% GDP. What he's suggesting is the system is in place, including the balance sheet of individuals, households, of businesses, where we can maybe have a shallow re recession, which is that resiliency that Bullard leads with. And meanwhile, Kelly, we are looking at perhaps the first week in four of gains for for U.S. equity markets, but they're not that broad-based when it comes to looking under the hood and still indicate a bit of caution. 
Yeah, shifting into defensive areas of the market like healthcare and technology as well, which has actually benefited from the fact that yields are actually moving lower, whereas the higher movement in yields for so much of this year has put pressure on some of those high multiple stocks. But as you say, Lisa, it is so nascent. We're still talking about a technology sector, the NASDAQ 100 <clears throat> index, that is down the better part of 30% on the year. So how much does one week make? And Tom, when you talk about 40 on the VIX, you've been talking about it for a couple of weeks now. When do we get the catharsis? When do we get the washout? And Amy Wu Silverman, I thought was brilliant talking about how in individual names you're starting to see an increasing amount of hedging activity. At what point does the calm get broken in the face of a VIX that still hasn't moved well, to the degree that you've been waiting for? Yeah, the VIX right now 28.77, which is very comforting over the length of the week. Let's call it from 32 uh, to 29. 40 is distant. And again, this goes, and we've heard this from any number of guests, uh, that flows. The tone that's out there is optimistic. Gerard Cassidy of RBC Capital Markets, I believe on the West Coast this week, said, you know, the, uh, the tone was pretty good. Yeah, and the tone is pretty good in markets, although off a little bit earlier highs. We're looking at about seven-tenths of a percent gain uh, for the NASDAQ and the S&P, both the same, 38.27 on S&P futures. The bid into bonds fading a bit. We are seeing yields higher price down 3.12 percent on the 10-year. Two-year similar move, although as Tom, uh, you described it earlier, as churn. I think that that's a uh, very well put. And crude, this to me is interesting. We saw a flip yesterday after crude had sold off in light of some of the recession worries, and it got a bid. This sort of push-pull between supply and demand and this idea of what could potentially be coming down the pike when it comes to a downturn. Right now, I really do think that the question at the moment is whether the bond market rally that we have seen this week is a good thing or a bad thing for stocks. Have we seen a revenge of the 60-40 portfolio that has some sort of persistency to it uh, that people hadn't been seeing for the bulk of this year so far? Michael Bell, global market strategist at J.P. Morgan Asset Management, uh, joining us here. Michael, what's your view on that? Do you think we're going to see a persistency to the rally or at least the, the uh, relationship between bonds and stocks from here on out? I certainly think that bonds have become a lot more attractive than they were. I mean, my simple point is that the housing market can't really handle 30-year uh, mortgage rates going up much more than they have already. So to me, that suggests that we're probably nearing the peak for bond yields. It's not to say they can go a little bit higher, um, but I think if bond yields were to move materially higher than where they are at the moment, and that fed through into even higher mortgage rates, <clears throat> then I think that's going to cause problems for the housing market. And that kind of caps out how right. high bond deals can go in my mind. Michael Bell, within the, 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 the fractious debate of J.P. Morgan, and it's a wonderful uh, debate, compare and contrast, for example, housing in your England from housing in America. Do you, do you people combine them together or are they truly distinct? I think they are quite different. Because in the US, you've got 95% of people on relatively long-term fixed-rate mortgages. Whereas in the UK, about 17% of people are on tracker mortgages, and another about a third of all the fixed-rate mortgages are fixed for two years or less. So the UK is going to feel the increase in interest rates much, much more quickly than the US would. However... The U.S. isn't completely immune to higher interest rates just because 95 percent of people are fixed. It means that the vast majority of people aren't even going to notice interest rates going up. But mm -hmm. who does notice? Of course, the people who notice are those who are moving homes. And for them, the 30-year mortgage rate's gone from sub-3 to about 5.75 today. At those kind of levels, if you look at the cost of buying a house, and bear in mind, house prices have gone up about 40% since the end of 2019 in the US, the amount that it would cost the average household as a percentage of their income to buy the average house today has approximately doubled over yeah. the last couple of years. So that's why I think that even though the US is much more resilient in terms of most people not feeling those higher rates, housing transactions uh, will come under pressure and already are starting to come under pressure because of these high rates. And for me, that's what caps out how high bond yields can go. Yeah, you won't find me house hunting anytime soon, Mike. I can tell you that much. As you talk about the, the capping of how high bond yields go, does that also form a bottom for the equity market? How close are we to that? Well, I think it depends really ultimately on 
whether we end up getting a recession or not, because I think you've seen valuations come down a long way. Uh, and valuations now, with the exception of some of the growth stocks in the US, which are still trading on a P of about 21, which is really remarkably high given how far stocks have fallen already so far this year. But the value sector of the market trading on a P of about 13 in the US and equities outside of the US, which are generally trading on P's of somewhere like 10 to 12, valuations look pretty reasonable. So the big question now is, given analysts are still forecasting that earnings are going to grow this year and next, is that too optimistic in the face of a potential recession? If we get a recession, then I think potentially there's a bit further downside as analysts' earnings expectations need to come down. But I would say, you know, with markets down as much as they are year to date, it's going to be hard to sell at these levels and then buy back in cheaper. You've really got to have a high degree of confidence that you can time the bottom if you think you're going to be able to do that. So I think it makes sense to be pretty neutral on risk assets at the moment, given all of that. Michael, it is now time in the week where we talk about feelings ahead of the consumer sentiment <laughs> read from the University of Michigan. And after the feelings that represented uh, by the consumer sentiment in the United Kingdom, which came in at the weakest, the worst going back half a century, <clears throat> is there a lack of cohesion right now between the feelings and the fundamentals in the equity market? Well, obviously, if you look around the world, both Michigan survey in the U.S., consumer confidence here in the U.K. and indeed in Europe, you've got basically near record lows on consumer confidence. That's because consumers are feeling the squeeze from higher prices. And add into that, they're facing the fact that uh, interest rates are going up as well. Now, is that you know, out of line with what the markets are pricing? Not particularly. Just look at the share price of retailers, for example, that right. have been absolutely hammered across the world. But I think that the market's not completely unaware of this risk that you're going to get a pullback in consumer spending. The question is just how much further has that got to go and whether right. we end up in recession or not. Michael Bell, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it. J.P. Morgan Asset Management. Moments ago, the first read of the weekend. There's no other way to put this. Our wonderful David Pan with a topic literally at the top of my reading pile this weekend, which is mining and Bitcoin and crypto. <laughs> Kaylee Lines, almost $4 billion in Bitcoin minor loans are coming under stress. This harkens to Raphael Auer of the Bank of International Settlements. Well, it really speaks to the liquidity issue that the entire crypto complex is facing. But for these miners, well, many of them have piled on the debt. They are now in serious crisis, as we've seen prices for cryptocurrencies come down to the point where they are now having to offload some of their stake in these coins, actually selling Bitcoin and some of the their mind reserves in order to be able to provide enough liquidity to continue operations. And I would note for the miners, Tom, a lot of it yeah. also comes back to the inflation story and to higher energy <clears throat> prices uh, story, because it costs a lot yeah. to keep these mines okay, in operation. Wait, they consume a lot of energy. Lisa, I got to go to Kaylee on this. I mean, we're talking thermodynamics here, and you killed that at UVA years ago. Oh, yeah. Kaylee Lines, what is a crypto miner? Basically, a crypto miner in a proof of work system is how you get the transactions in cryptocurrency. Someone has to do a bunch of complicated math on a computer in order to make it work. Now, there is movement, especially on the Ethereum blockchain, to moving toward proof of stake, in which that process is a lot less complicated. Basically, you just have to put up your own stake in order to process a transaction. And in theory, Tom, that makes the whole thing more energy efficient, though that upgrade to yeah. Ethereum, that would put it to proof of stake, keeps getting pushed further yeah. and further out. So there's a question of whether or not we get it. Was yeah. that really wonky? Yeah, it was very I wonky. Like I, I would wonky. just suggest T-Bone or New York Strip. I don't know which. Lisa, <laughs> right there was a clinic on my skepticism is all. Folks, I'll be blunt. Read David Pan at Bloomberg. It is a brilliant story on mining. Read Raphael Auer at the Bank of International Settlements. I don't know what to say about it. Uh, that it's brilliant. Futures up 30. This is uh, this is Bitcoin. Good morning. <laughs>Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. It's being called the biggest breakthrough in U.S. gun safety in three decades. The Senate voted 65 to 33 to approve bipartisan legislation that will improve background checks, secure schools and give states money to fight gun violence. The House is also expected to pass the measure. The Senate passed the bill hours after the Supreme Court issued a landmark ruling that could mean more guns on the streets of big cities. 
In the UK, Prime Minister Boris Johnson has suffered a major election upset. His Conservative Party lost a key parliament seat in southwest England. It's the first time that the constituency, Tiverton and Honiton, has not voted Conservative since it was formed 25 years ago. The Liberal Democrats won the seat. Crop prices have crashed back to where they were at the start of the war in Ukraine. That potentially could bring some relief to food inflation that is squeezing consumers. Wheat, soybean, oil and sugar are amongst farm commodities that have retreated in recent weeks. The Bloomberg Agriculture Spot sub-index is on track for its worst week since 2011. And shares of Twitter are higher in pre-market trade. According to the business site Insider, Twitter sent further user data this week to Elon Musk, who wants to buy the company. The latest data includes real-time information, which allows Musk team to determine how many users are actually bots. Last week, Musk lawyers sent Twitter a letter complaining that the data that they were being supplied just wasn't enough. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rutika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. This June, in honor of Pride Month and Juneteenth, Bloomberg brings you a special equality series every Thursday in June at 1 p.m. Eastern. Bloomberg Equality, celebrating inclusion this Pride Month and all year long. Yes, we can. The changes that we're seeing taking place in economic perform performance are to be expected. Uh, all of these changes were acknowledged by risks, as risks by ministers, by the Commission, by the ECB. So it is a risk, but yes, we can avoid it. Pascal Donahoe, the Eurogroup president there, uh, speaking on the issues at end meetings this weekend, of course, uh, in Europe. We've got to squeeze this in. It's too important. Lisa Bramowitz, uh, Bullard of St. Louis in Europe with UBS, I think, in Zurich, uh, looking for a 3.5% Fed funds rate, tip show market, pricing in 35 Fed fund. That's a big deal, Lisa. I'm sorry. That's optimism. And this is the uh, coming away from that 4% Fed funds rate that yeah. some people were looking for and that we heard Andrew Hollenhorst of Citigroup reiterate uh, yesterday. How much right. do we see people easing off their expectations for how far the Fed will have to go? Two-year yield yanks back from under 3%, 3.08%, up seven basis points. Ten-year yield, 3.11%. Dollar quiescent all in all uh, this morning. This is an immense joy right now. Shahab Jalanus is global head of FX strategy at Credit Suisse and joins us this morning and I want to go to the magnitude of your calls I want to go weak yen well out past 140 and Swiss franc we've been watching the last 20 minutes to see if we go through parity strong euro Swissy coming down nicely under parity and you say goes further why do we get these magnitude of moves in foreign exchange well we're seeing the end of the former system of central banks using balance sheets to essentially manipulate where FX rates trade. And as that system frees up uh, or comes under pressure, you're seeing FX rates react to that. In Switzerland, they're much further ahead than where Japan is right now in making that transition. Japan is trying to stay, stay the course as long as possible. So that's what we're seeing reflected in FX. So are you calling for a Bretton Woods moment? I mean, is it a big enough shift coming off of balance sheet dynamics that it's a la after World War II and what Keynes and the others did at Mount Washington? It doesn't need to be as big as that to still have very significant effects for FX investors. Let's, let's put it that way. So, for example, in, in the Euro-Swiss cross, uh, it's very easy for us to imagine that cross going down to 97, even lower uh, in the weeks to come. What does it do to a McDonald's hamburger and a bond stuff just down from the Credit Suisse office asking for a friend? <laughs> Yeah, it's a good idea to, to think about those things. Uh, I guess they, they will get more expensive, um, but that's not something that, that is worrying the yeah. SMB at this point. So, uh, Lisa, that top ticks out at $20 for a number two value meal. Uh, I'm sure that there is some personal experience worked there in there. I can't figure it out, but I think I, that's my hunch. Mm -hmm. uh, Shab, I wonder how much you're looking at peak yields, as we were just hearing from Mike Bell of J.P. Morgan, and how much does that mean peak dollar, right? How much are these two uh, measures really trading in tandem? Well, look, it's, it's definitely been the case that rate differentials and uh, the U.S.'s much higher yields have been helpful for the dollar. But to be honest, I think there's more to the dollar story than just yields. For example, uh, on the trade side, there's been 
very big shifts in, in uh, trade dynamics that really need to be recognized. So, for example, right now we have uh, the euro area with a, with a trade deficit. We have Japan moving rapidly in, this, in the same direction as well. So currencies like the euro and the yen that historically uh, were backed by trade surpluses, current account surpluses, the whole energy price shift and the terms of trade shift has really changed that dynamic materially. And meanwhile, on the US side, you have record exports at this point. There's going to be nearly $200 billion of just agricultural exports in this fiscal year, uh, according to projections from, from uh, that side of the, the, the story. So when you put all that together, to me, there's more to the dollar strength story than just rate differentials at this point. This is a really important point. How does this translate into some of the big crosses, whether it's euro parity or just in general, how strong the dollar can get? Well, I think the dollar right now looks strong compared to the last three to five years, that's for sure. But I think if you go back much further, uh, the dollar has been a lot stronger for a variety of reasons. And the key point I would make is it's not the same dollar as the last time euro dollar was at 105. You know, when you have euro now with trade deficits uh, as a problem, you basically need capital inflows into the euro area and on a net basis if you're going to have a current account deficit. And that's something that has been missing. The euro has been a capital exporter uh, for, for many, many years. So there's a new value proposition that the euro needs to offer uh, at this point in time, simply to, to avoid going down. Uh, and I think that's absent right now. Well, let's move from Europe to the island just next to it. We had UK consumer confidence data earlier today showing a record low, the lowest in 48 years of data, clearer concern around inflation, the cost of living, the possibility of a recession. How does that feed through to your view on sterling? We think sterling is, is still going to go lower. Uh, we are looking for a test of 120 on cable again uh, and eventually a move through that level. Uh, the problem for sterling really, you still have that same trade story developing that I, I mentioned for the, for the euro area in Japan. Uh, it's not like years of a weak pound have created big trade surpluses or very competitive UK exports. That just hasn't happened for a variety of reasons. Uh, and so you have a currency that doesn't really have any reason to go up right now. Um, even when you think about the Bank of England, uh, the market is pricing in 50 basis point hikes consecutively for a few meetings uh, ahead of us, and yet the Bank of England is constantly pushing back against that narrative and makes it very difficult to realize uh, what's already priced in. So when you put that, those factors on the table, sterling is still going to go lower. Uh, Shaw, i got to get more questions. Um, you got to go, but, you know, Please come back soon as soon as you can. I got these are some abrupt calls here from Shab Jalan. It's, it's a different landscape out there for all of us investors, including Jerome Powell, uh, with the kind of moves that Credit Suisse is talking about. Mr. Bullard with headlines coming out fast and furious. Email Qantas from Perth emails in and says, Tom, you know, forget about the McDonald's burger in Switzerland. He talks about the Bank of Japan and Kaylee, the impact of the new. Oyako teriyaki burger and what weak yen means seriously to the whole domestic system of, of Japan. Yeah, maybe cheap fast food, not so cheap. Tom, it's not just the teriyaki burger. Imagine the teriyaki burger. 20, 20, was I 20? Maybe 19, Japan. I'm out in Osaka. I just want McDonald's. And I am greeted with a huge poster of chocolate-covered French fries. It's a thing. Would you ever put those two things together? No, I would not put those two things together. <laughs> but I'm only, you know, I'm down daily. My my executive lunch at the Third Avenue McDonald's. So, you know, that's, that's mm. a, little, a little different there as well. Lisa, we have bonds on the move. I'm sorry. We've got a higher yield regime. What's the why, do you think? Well, why have we seen such a rally so far uh, this year? I mean, this month, I shouldn't say this year. It's been a complete sell-off this year. This week, we've seen a little bit of a reprieve. Give it all back, yeah. When do we all give it all back? Do we go to a Mike Bell a peak yield kind of uh, position in the world? Are we looking at one retracement I, okay. of higher inflation, of an aggressive Fed, and the same narrative that we seem to have abandoned this week? By this afternoon, quickly, Lisa, do we see curve inversion on the 210 spread? People are looking for it there. later this year, whether it happens at the end of today. I'm going to leave that to you no. to decide. And Jan Hatia is who you said no. moved the needle. So I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll wake up after the surveillance nap and maybe we'll see that three basis points right now. The difference in yield between the 10 year and the two year uh, yield. Futures up 27. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg.
Reporting surveillance. Good morning, everyone. Futures up 26. Green on the screen. VIX from 32 into a 28 level this week. Optimism. So, uh, Lisa, help me with yield here right now. I need help on the data check. Uh, we were under 3%. We're now at 3.07. You, were, you really wonder where we'll be at 3 p.m. this afternoon. How quickly things are moving. And just to yeah. give some perspective, in about a month, <clears throat> yields on the front end rose by about a percentage point, which is an astronomical amount in proportion if you think about where it has been. And then it's come in 50 basis points in a about a week. I mean, if you think about how much we've seen these absolute whipsaw moves, how much more can we see going forward, Tom? I'm also looking at 10 year yields, uh, also indicated upward. The why? I don't know, maybe it's the Fed chair, uh, Fed, uh, St. Louis Fed chair uh, president, excuse me, uh, Jim Bullard coming out and saying that he wants yeah. to front load it. I don't know if you can really give a narrative to this other than really jumpy markets. Jumpy markets and lots of really good conversation today. For Global Wall Street, this is not only the conversation of the day on fixed income for Bloomberg surveillance, but indeed for the week and can I dare say for Q2. Ian Lingen is out of Minnesota in the Carlson School of Finance. It is absolutely definitive with a tour of duty at Yale as well and holds court at BMO Capital Markets and writes absolutely the most dense note on fixed income dynamics on the street. We're thrilled he could join us in studio uh, today. Ian, welcome to Bloomberg. I'm going to cut to the chase. Forget about the y-axis, moving yields. Your note right now is on the mystery of the x-axis as Bullard talks about front loaning and that. Give us the nuance to the pro, pro audience of the x-axis dynamic, the first and second derivatives of the time change we're going to see. Well, I think that this is the most important conversation in financial markets at the moment. It's really the answer to the question, how can Bullard be talking about a 350 terminal rate when the reality is that two-year yields are trading at or below 3%? It really comes down to the 24-month moving window represented by right. the two-year notes. And effectively what the market is saying is you might hike now, but you're going to have to start cutting much sooner than in prior cycles. Leave fixed income and go over to Jan Hatzius at Goldman Sachs Economics, where he and I talked about core CPI and the idea that we don't have a real understanding of the rate of change of how core CPI is going to come down. Do you share that uncertainty? I certainly do. I would add one nuance, Please. however, and that is all inflation is the same at this moment for the Fed. Headline inflation, core inflation, they've made no distinction. That's interesting because in the past they would always focus on core inflation over headline because it was less volatile. But the realities of higher energy prices, higher food prices, and the fact that inflation has become the political touchstone at this point makes all inflation equal. And I think that will change, but not until the midterms. Ian, is peak rates, it's peak yields, have we already gotten past that? Are we basically at a place where you can say definitively that that is an accurate characterization of what we've seen? Well, that is certainly our call, but I will note that I said the same thing once we got to 320. So at 350, the logic holds a lot better, but the reality is there's going to eventually be demand for 10 and 30 year paper, and we haven't seen the key investor classes of Japan or certain parts of Europe really come in and start buying treasuries yet. And when we do, that will be worth uh, 35 to 45 basis points in tens, and that gets you back below 3 percent, the curve more inverted, and the market even more worried about a recession. So, Ian, is this supportive for risk assets if the market is going to get more uh, worried about recession and could potentially have to uh, reduce their estimates for margins and profits? So that is, again, one of the key uncertainties. I would, would normally say, yes, you have a less aggressive Fed, you have lower rates, you should have a good setup for risk assets. But this Fed is behaving much differently than we might have otherwise anticipated, so we could see a, the, poss the possibility of a recession increase, but the Fed, instead of having the traditional response, just push forward and say, yeah, three and a half, we're going to get there. We might push it into a recession, but the reality is it's worth keeping the decades of hard-won credibility as an inflation fighter for the Fed for this one cycle. Well, Bill Ackman of Pershing Square says the Fed already has a credibility problem and that the bond market is misreading the Fed. To quote one of his tweets, he said that the market is flat out ignoring Powell and the governor's commentary. Expect even more hawkish commentary until the bond market wakes up. Who's asleep, Ian, Bill Ackman or the bond market? 
Well, I'll tell you this much. If you look at break-evens, what you can see is that inflation expectations continue to move lower and lower, and lower, and that is a vote of confidence in the Fed's ability to control inflation and forward inflation expectations. So uh, one thing can be said, the tips market certainly isn't asleep at the moment. Well, and Jim Bullard, as we said, have said that the tips pricing is pretty much uh, right on at the moment. So as we put all of this together, the market has confidence in the Fed's ability to fight inflation. What it has less confidence in is what the ultimate result of that inflation fighting is, how deep a recession will be when and if one arrives. Ian, what is your assessment of that and ultimately what that means for how low we could see yields going? So I think that at this point, part of the conversation that isn't uh, occurring in the markets is we're just coming off of a negative real GDP print for Q1, which was negative 1.5 after revisions. Right now, GDP for the second quarter is tracking at zero. So if we have a repeat of the higher than expected inflation uh, profile in the U.S., we could actually dip below zero for real growth in the <clears throat> second quarter. And that would make a recession a very uh, near-term event. Caveat, though, that's not the same type of recession that the market is talking about. The market's worried about a real recession with higher unemployment that we actually see a, an aggregate hit to nominal demand. And that's not where we are yet. Ian Lingen, part of your world. If you're on radio and television, Ian Lingen of BMO Capital Markets joins us right now. The conversation of the week on fixed income. You and I have never seen these bond losses. And I'm fascinated and honored to ask you this question, which is get away from the nuances. The bottom line is the total return index, a Bloomberg Lingen total return index, is negative 12%. How does bond psychology change if people are looking out to 2024, 25, 26 to catch up from these losses? Well, I think an important aspect of bond losses in the Treasury market is to keep in mind who the major players tend to be. A the people taking the loss. <laughs> a lot of the people taking the loss are indexed or, are, or match, are attempting to match their index, but everybody's been short. And so on paper, it's a pretty significant loss, but a good portion of the investment community has fared reasonably well. Okay, but well. what about, come on, what about mere mortals? They open up their statement from BMO Capital mm -hmm. Markets and go, they start saying profanity about Lingen. The real world out there, this is a bond mar market we've never seen. Mm -hmm. It's worse than Volcker's bond market. Mm -hmm. I think that the person at home opening their statement, what they're really going to be thinking in the back of their mind is, wow, mortgage rates are almost 6%. That might be the problem. So a little bit of pain in terms of the opportunity to invest in higher treasury yields is one thing. But as the ramifications of the Fed's tighter monetary policy continue to push through to the, the employment and the uh, housing market, I think that's where we start to get worried. Ian, how much is your peak yields uh, thesis right now hinging on this idea that the inflationary inputs are transitory, that we still have this stealth transitory narrative guiding a lot of investors and even the Federal Reserve? I think that the peak inflation or the peak rates narrative is actually based more on the hawkishness and the aggressiveness of the Fed. Regardless of how inflation plays out, what we know is that a lot of what has occurred, at least over the course of the last six or eight months, has been a function of distortions created by the pandemic, the supply side on the energy sector, and now food inflation is very material. Fast forward to uh, this time next year. The year-over-year -year inflation prints will not be as high. That doesn't mean it was necessarily transitory. That either means that the Fed was that much more hawkish or, in fact, prices moderated just based on demand. Ian, while we're fast-forwarding, fast-forward to 10 a.m. when we get those UMICH sentiment numbers, is the bond market going to latch onto more of the pure sentiment read, how, how bad it is and what that means for growth prospects, or the inflation expectations and what that means as to whether or not the Fed is actually going to have to be more hawkish for longer if that is becoming entrenched in the economy? I think that the headline consumer confidence figure at record low levels is extremely telling. And when we look at the correlation, it really comes down to gasoline prices <clears throat> and equity performance. And both of those have been going the wrong direction for the there to be any additional confidence. I think that we are going to focus on confidence over inflation expectations mm -hmm. because the Fed has communicated that they're going to do everything it takes to keep inflation anchored. Very quickly here. Do bonds have catharsis? We think about stocks going down, VIX of 40, et cetera. Does that happen with bonds? Does everybody sell at the same time? So there does tend to be key moments of capitulation 
in one direction or the other. And right now, as I mentioned, uh, the vast majority of the market is short treasuries. There'll be a point where people wake up and they okay. say, oh, I, don't, I don't want to miss out on these higher yields. Wonderful to see you. I have a lot of message here on Ian's you. research. Again, we protect the copyright of all of our guests. Find that research at BMO Capital Markets. Ian Lincoln with us uh, today. Lisa, you continue the discussion forward in the next hour. Another Faro property. <laughs> yeah, we're going to be speaking on the open with a host of great guests. Rob Waldner of Invesco, a chief fixed income strategist, and Phil Orlando of Federated Hermes. I'm excited to have this conversation about have we seen peak yields? Is this because of real aggression uh, from the Federal Reserve? And if that's the case, how much has stock, uh, as stock markets really priced this in? Because if that is the case, real hawkishness spurring a, a particular Hawkish downturn. Is. Are stocks being really uh, true to the downturn in margins? There we go. That's the gloom we need. The toxic brew of hawkishness is, uh, well, 210 spread, it comes in. Will we see inversion today or Monday? Who knows? 3.71% 3.71 basis points, I should say, the difference in yield there. Curve flattening this morning. Two-year yield all over the place. Higher yield by six basis points, 3.7%. 0.7% uh, as well. And the equity market continue the generous lift, I'm going to call, day after day, the NASDAQ. I can't give you the 12,000 item, 11,800 on the NASDAQ, up eight tenths of a percent. Stay with us on radio, on television. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Actions by the U.S. Senate and the Supreme Court have underscored the deep divisions over gun policy. The Senate voted 65 to 33 to approve gun safety legislation. It calls for improving background checks, securing schools and giving states money to combat gun violence. The House is also expected to approve the measure. Senate passage came hours after the Supreme Court issued a landmark ruling that could mean more guns on the streets of big cities. Five Republican members of Congress are said to have contacted the White House after the 2020 election, seeking pardons from President Trump. That's according to video testimony played by the committee investigating the January 6th insurrection. The congressmen included Matt Gates, Scott Perry, Andy Biggs, Louis Gohmert and Mo Brooks. Wall Street's biggest banks are now set to return tens of billions of dollars to investors. They all passed the Federal Reserve's annual test to their ability to withstand market turmoil. The stress test showed that banks such as JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs could handle what could be a severe recession. In the UK, consumers are starting to crumple in the face of soaring prices. The government says the volume of goods sold in stores and online fell one half of 1% in May. The big jump in food prices forced consumers to cut back on spending in supermarkets. Meanwhile, another report says consumer confidence in the UK has fallen to a record low this month. And Europe's travel chaos is about to get worse just as the summer vacation period gets underway. Lufthansa is cancelling 3,100 flights after a wave of coronavirus infections led to more staffing shortages. Travel demand has rebounded dramatically in Europe. That has subjected passengers to cancellations and lines lasting hours. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. I think Powell is, is, is trying to finesse it. I don't think that it's very clear for him what, inter what indeed the terminal rate is right now. Um, I think that he's got to continue to guide the market towards hawkishness. He can't go wobbly on the resolution to tackle inflation right now. Greg Staples, DWS Group, head of North American Fixed Income, uh, there with really important comments on fixed income. And we really thank Ian Ling and Abimo Capital Markets for darkening the door uh, today as well. Right now, to get your weekend started, to really begin to think about the next six months, Kriti Gupta, with perspective here, wh what are you talking about, Kriti? Euro something? We're talking about Euro dollars. Uh, we're talking about it in the context of what they're pricing in when it talks about not just rate hikes, but rate cuts. If you actually look at the 12 months forward euro dollar spread. Now, essentially, this is what the bond market right now is pricing in going at 12 months out into the road. So essentially in mid 2023. And for our radio audience, essentially what you need to know is that they're actually pricing in about 43 basis points of negative rate. So the idea here being that in mid 2023, at least for what the current bond market is pricing in, they're going to start to, to expect perhaps some recessionary pressures or like pressures to which they expect that the Federal Reserve will have to act 
<clears throat> using some of those rate cuts. And that's really what this chart of the day holds. Whether that actually happens or manifests in a year time is another story. But uh, it's significant to know that those right. bets have been increasing in the past few weeks. This is a Bramwitz territory. K uh, Kaylee and I have absolutely no comment on this whatsoever. Pretty good to thank you <laughs> so much. K seriously, Kaylee, my head is spinning over all this fed babble it's recession. been it's been hard to follow and that's really been right. true for weeks and months now tom ever since you know right. the hawkishness started ramping up i don't know if any mm. of us can really assign a narrative around this bond market or this equity market no. for that matter we will see now we've had a lot of important conversations this week but we've saved the best for my last of the week because and this is serious the airlines are a mess we are honored to bring you senior research analyst at cowan Helene Becker, working with the wonderful Kai Von Rumer, they are truly the adults of the industry. Helene, I'm going to ask the question that every single listener and viewer wants to know, including Mrs. Keene. Is this turmoil in airlines sacrificing or risking the wonderful safety record of commercial airlines? No, not at all. Um, the U.S. Uh, and really worldwide Airlines pr pride themselves on, on being safe, safety first. That's the most important thing. Um, and I think that's that will be the ca case going forward. The, the issue with delays and cancellations, of course, is a whole nother story. Okay, I, I don't want to make jokes about this because the surveillance team personally has seen this. We've all got our own stories on this as well. Let's start with the pilot shortage. They're not going to fix this by Labor Day, are they? No, no, not at all. Can't be. Um, so, so think about it this way. Over the past two years, uh, approximately 10,000 pilots retired or left the profession. Um, the industry needs to hire to replace that just to get back to where we were in 2019. So that's about 10,000 pilots right there. And then there are about 2,000 pilots retiring annually this decade. So when you think about replacing those 10,000 plus the additional 2,000 that we need just to replace retiring pilots and then pilots on top of growth, we estimate we need something like 15,000 pilots this year, another 5,000 pilots next year, again in 2024. So you're looking at 20,000 pilots over the next three years, two and a half years, and we just don't turn that many out. Okay, so Helene, you have a, a labor pilot shortage that is leading to all of these problems, leading a consumer like me to look at all these headlines of flights, thousands of them canceled each and every weekend, and that when I'm shopping for flights, I see how much ticket prices have still going up. Are still going up. I'm looking at that, saying I'm going to take the train. I mean, at what point help. does this just exacerbate oh, uh, the Critty, issue of is demand Helene destruction? Uh, Critty, uh Excuse me, Kaylee, is Helene Becker your travel agent? Is that what you're doing? You're booking a flight with a lady from Coward? Come on. No, but I'm sure as an airline analyst, she analyzes consumer sentiment around airlines, specifically yeah, exactly. these higher prices, which to this point, airlines have had success in passing on some of those higher fuel costs through the mechanism of raising, raising ticket prices. But as Americans pay more for their own gasoline, Helene, how long can they really do that? Well, exactly, Kelly. You make very good points here. Not only is it higher gasoline prices to get to work, right? It costs many people twice as much as it was costing them six months ago. And then you have higher food costs, higher rent, and so on. So, yes, this is a major problem. And ticket mm -hmm. prices, to your point, are going up. And we don't see them coming down because you don't have enough staff. And it's not just pilots, by the way. People don't realize that the U.S. hasn't trained any air traffic controllers for two years. There on the hunt now to find more. Um, I think I looked at the numbers yesterday and we saw something like um, 4,000 air traffic controllers are needed. It takes four years to train an air traffic controller and, and then another two years for experience. So we're <laughs> short them. We're short pilots. We're short stopped at every airport and ticket prices are going up. And yes, you are Absolutely right. There is a point at which consumers are going to say enough. We, we cannot take this anymore and we'll stop traveling. Um, and, and the airlines are kind of pushing the, the consumer into that direction, aren't they? Because mm -hmm. they are reducing capacity. So there aren't as many flights available. And when there aren't as many seats and there's a lot of demand, they have to um, raise ticket prices and then people opt out. And to your point, Kelly, they either train or drive. Not right. that driving is cheap, but exactly so. They, they make uh, other choices. Okay. 
Okay, I know you love United Airlines. Kirby's got his hands full right now. Look at Newark this week. Are you going to move your buy hold sells based on all this trauma? Well, we're we're always reviewing our ratings for um, valuation. Well, we give try us a heads up. No one's listening. Off. Come on, Helena. You don't have to publish <laughs> Monday. Give me some news I can work with here. Yeah, so we we review our ratings on a on a daily basis um, based on valuation and what we think the airlines can earn, and right. we still have the airlines profitable this year um, and next uh, for that okay. matter. But you know, we're hoping we're we're, we're hoping that costs start right. to to at least flatten out. Helene Becker, thank you. Great of you to come to us on a Friday. Really appreciate it. Helene Becker of Cowan on all the challenges that are out there. Kaylee, I, I, I look at the weekend. Last weekend, I was watching BitDog move tick by tick down under 18,000. Why does Bitcoin go down on the weekend? Is just everybody steps away? It is such an unusual phenomenon. There's a lot of people that have been tracking this. So much of the price action comes when U.S. Mm, equity markets right. are closed. I wish I had a clear reason why, Tom. I don't have one, but it is definitely a really interesting phenomenon to look at. I will say this well, weekend in Bitcoin has been much more boring than last mm, week was overall. Let me do a data check here to exit out here. Lots more coming. 10 a.m. in yeah. one hour and four minutes. Arguably the statistic of the week. I know it's coming late. Stay with us, folks, for the Michigan Inflation Expectations uh, Statistic. Chairman Powell will be looking at that as well. Futures up 25, Dow Futures up 182, yields reverse, higher yield 3.07% on the two-year yield. What's great in television is when someone in the control room actually has to talk in my ear for the first time and understand the weight and pressure. We are thrilled at Bloomberg Surveillance to say Rachel from, Sw from Swellsley, <laughs> survived the last uh, 10 minutes. We welcome her, welcome her into the trenches of Bloomberg surveillance. Please stay with us again. Inflation expectations, Michigan in 64 minutes. This is Bloomberg.